Alors, est-ce que tout le monde est connecté? Is everybody connected? Là, je m'adresse aux collègues. Écoutez, à Dakar, on est connecté. <rire> Il me semble que... Euh, bonjour. Euh, le Quai Branly. Je ne sais pas si le Quai Branly est déjà euh, connecté. Je vais voir tout de suite. D'accord. Est-ce que M. Garlandini est là? Oui, oui, je suis ici. Je suis ah, là. Ah, voilà. Bonjour. 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 Alors, bonjour, très bien. bonjour. Alors, donc, on va... On peut, on peut, donc, est, tout est bon, alors on peut... On peut ouvrir la, la session, alors? Oui, Lazare, allez-y. Merci beaucoup. Parfait. Super. Alors, mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning. Bon après-midi. So, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, depending on where you are located. Monsieur le Président, Carlandini. Chairman, Mr. Bellandini, distinguished uh, directors of museums, uh, I'd like uh, to wish uh, all of you a very warm welcome on the reflection on the future of museums, a debate that has been organized by UNESCO. I'm Lazare Londo, Director of Culture and Emergencies at UNESCO. More than a year has passed since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, disrupted the whole world and affected our lives, wherever we are in the world. The cultural sector has uh, been hard hit and uh, museums are no exception. Even if we see here and there some glimmers of hope and renewal of cultural life, and reopening of museum institutions. We know that the opposite is also true, that all this is still very fragile. Thus, while the Wonder Adyatice Museum in Berlin has just reopened its doors this Tuesday, at almost the same time, the Vatican museums had to close their doors once again. In this unstable and fragile context, the time chosen for this debate seems particularly opportune because we can see that in the absence of a miracle and unique solution, a sharing of experiences can nourish reflections on an issue as essential as the future of museums. What lessons can be learned from the pandemic? What are the challenges to be met? How can museums remain essential to society and their communities? These are questions that all museums are asking themselves and it is indeed UNESCO's role to serve as a platform for exchange and to host an international dialogue to advance the search for answers and solutions with you all. This debate today is uh, part of UNESCO's promotion of one of its recommendations, which is more re relevant than ever. The 2015 recommendation concerning the protection and pro promotion of museums and collections, that their diversity and their role in society. This recommendation recalls among the functions of museums, not only preservation, research, communication and education, but also their major role in development, quality of life, integration, and social cohesion. First of all, I would like to warmly thank our panelists and moderators. 
our distinguished museum directors from all geographical regions coming from Africa, Arab states, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Latin America, North America, Asia Pacific. Uh, thank you once again for having accepted to participate in this debate, which is very important indeed. So the first part of the debate, which will start uh, in a few moments, and which will end uh, around, well, which will last about uh, an hour and 15 minutes, is uh, devoted to the question of the lessons learned from one year of the pandemic. We will listen to our panelists talk about the dramatic and multiple consequences of the health crisis on their institutions, the innovations as well, and how the museums have adapted. In the second part of the debate, we wished to focus on the post-COVID steps or era, as the health crisis has irrevocably shown that we must adapt our institutions to a new post-crisis reality. So this debate will be transmitted in English and in French. I invite you to widely share all through the debate your comments but also using the two hashtags, which are important for this event, which are hashtag share culture and hashtag COVID-19 to communicate about the event. The international crisis that we're experiencing requires a concerted international response. You all agree. So on behalf of our Assistant Director General for Culture, Mr. Ernesto Ottone, who will be joining us in the last part of this debate, I wish to thank very sincerely the President of the International Council of Museums, Mr. Alberto Garandini. I would very much like to welcome his presence because ICOM is a key partner of UNESCO. We have been cooperating with ICOM in many aspects and for many years, and we're very happy to further strengthen our cooperation with you. I would now like to give you the floor, dear Alberto. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear Assistant Director General, dear Director of Culture, dear friends and colleagues, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Let me start thanking UNESCO and Mr. Ottone for inviting me to this debate on the future of museums in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemics. ICOM was founded in November 1946 during the first UNESCO conference and for 75 years UNESCO and ICOM have worked hand in hand for common goals. Cultural exchange, diversity, mutual understanding, and peaceful relations among peoples. Our sector is going through the most serious crisis in its modern history. ICOM surveys on the impact of the first and second waves of COVID-19 have confirmed a widespread climate of uncertainty about the future. While some museums have reopened with major limitations, many others stay closed. 30% of museums fear downsizing and 6% a permanent closure. Many professionals, especially consultants and independent workers 
often young and motivated colleagues are facing furloughs and terminations. We are risking losing their knowledge and commitment, which would be a catastrophe. The loss of income due to the lockdown has been traumatic. Many museums will have to reconsider their business models and reinvent their social role. More than 50% of museums complain that so far they have received neither direct nor indirect financial support from governments. The pandemic has dramatically increased inequalities and widened disparities in access to heritage and in participation to cultural life. The return of visitors to museums will be slow. In a scenario marked by the crisis of mass tourism, fewer resources and persistent restrictions, museum professionals are working hard to reassure governments and citizens that visiting museums is as safe and rewarding an experience now as it has always been. ICOM has launched several initiatives to support museums. In all international and national fora, ICOM advocating for emergency funds and for keeping museums in the agendas of policy makers. We have issued ethical, scientific and social recommendations on reopening, security, conservation, community resilience and digital outreach. These recommendations are being used by museums and governments as standard references. Even in lockdown, ICOM has kept providing quality services for members, from webinars to resources, from online training to grants, such as the two calls for ICOM solidarity projects. The COVID-19 emergency has led museums to accelerate change and explore new solutions. True to its resilient and creative character, our sector has been able to transform this crisis, terrible crisis, into a catalyst for innovations, notably an increased focus on digitization and the creation of new forms of cultural experience and dissemination. To foster the spirit of building back better, ICOM has proposed the future of museum recover and reimage for theme of the 2021 International Museum Day. Since 1977, on May 18th, the Museum Day brings together thousands of museums around the world to celebrate their role. 2021 is a pivotal year for our rethink for our society. And ICOM Day call museums to lead the change. The time is now to rethink our relationship with the communities we serve, to experiment with new and hybrid models of cultural participation, and to strongly reaffirm the essential value of museums for the constructions of a just, sustainable future. Last year, we faced a great challenge, but the biggest one is yet to come. Thanks to long-standing and successful cooperation, UNESCO and ICOM will continue fostering innovation, creativity, and reimagination of a future where museums and heritage can thrive. As our founding father believed, only together we will be able to move forward. Thanks for your attention.
Merci, cher Alberto, pour uh, ces mots vraiment très important. Thank you very much, dear Alberto, for this very uh, wonderful words, very encouraging, very inspiring. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, as you rightly emphasize, these are moments that are very important and a very strong mobilization of the whole community of the sector of museums is extremely important uh, together with UNESCO. Now, I would also like to transmit to, to all of you here today the importance uh, uh, that the Director General of UNESCO has for this debate and its uh, reflections uh, that we will be undertaking. So we will now launch the debate. So, so for the first panel, I have the pleasure of welcoming Mrs. Lorella isap Hasson the director of uh, Memorial Act. The Memorial Act uh, is the Caribbean International Museum in memory of the slave trade and slavery in, uh, situated in Pointe-à-Pitre. Uh, Lorella, very briefly to introduce her, she is curator of the heritage of the Ministry of uh, Culture of France, a specialist in African collections and Creole cultures. She's also art historian with a diploma from the Louvre School and University of Sorbonne and the National Institute of Heritage. Lorella, it is always a great pleasure to have you with us. And uh, thank you very much for having accepted to moderate our first panel. May I, without further ado, give you the floor? Thank you. Thank you, dear Lazar. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very happy, of course, to uh, be here with you and uh, to uh, be moderating this debate. Uh, and. Um, this uh, can help us to reduce the distances uh, virtually, distances that we have in our professional lives today. It is also the opportunity for me to first of all thank UNESCO for this invitation and uh, to thank you and your team for having invited me for this exchange with the 12 museum directors. We are an excellent company. And in the course of this first panel discussion, we'll be discussing uh, with five of them the strengths and the weaknesses of the museums in the face of COVID-19, because it is in these times of crisis that our institutions reveal themselves in what is specific to them and what makes for their strength, but also also what uh, may uh, represent their weaknesses and what could be further improved. Now, in the course of this uh, panel discussion, our colleagues, directors of museums will be sharing with us the lessons that they've been able to draw from this experience, uh, uh, something that surprised us in the course of our programming and our activities. Uh, this pandemic and why is it such a challenge for our museums obviously because our institutions normally have the experience of change in the long term sometimes very long term to build a museum from the first stone to the inauguration requires a minimum of 10 years and to renew it um, you also need often 10 additional years uh, to change it. And this crisis has really shaken us in our pace, in our certainties, in our habits, and has forced us to reflect very quickly, to adapt ourselves very fast, to act very fast, and sometimes uh, almost uh, with great immediacy uh, because of uh, the lockdowns and the, the need to renew ourselves very quickly, our vision of the museum as an institution to re-found our practices. We had to reinvent ourselves because uh, today and uh, for a long time, 
think, conceive, design program, and uh, prepare projects at a pace which was not a pace that we normally had adopted in the past. Our colleagues, directors of museums in this panel who've uh, agreed to share their experiences with us will be giving us their points of view from different points of the world. We've got people from Bogota, Berlin, Beijing, Rome, and even London. So I would like to welcome the attention of UNESCO in the gender balance of this panel and uh, also say that at the international level, few women for the moment are directors of museums. And so for this panel, it is Mr. Hunt who's a minority and Mr. Wong. Uh, so there is a true balance, gender balance that has been chosen by UNESCO. So I would like to introduce the five museum directors who are going to be choosing, sharing, sorry, their experience with us, starting with Mrs. Barbara Helving, director of uh, World Asiatician Museum Berlin. Welcome, Barbara. Very happy to have you with us. You're an archaeologist, specialist of uh, ancient Near East. And in this region, you've participated in several ex uh, from the, the, uh, several years um, archaeological uh, digs, and you were appointed uh, the Tehran Office of the Archaeological Office of Berlin, Germany. You're archaeologist, professor for 2019. Since 2019, you've been the director of uh, the Wood Asiatische Museum. May I introduce Mr. Hunt now, director of the Victoria and Albert Museum of London. We've already met before in UNESCO, and I'm really happy to see you again here to speak about those issues, the, the issues that your institution met with and all the inventive, creative decisions you had to take. So you're uh, basically a historian specialized in uh, the Victorian era, and you also work as a journalist and also a politician. You were an MP between 2010 and 2017, and you also taught taught uh, history in London. And finally, you've written several history books. You're the director of the v a since uh, 2017. Now we are going to Rome, and I introduce Ms. Barbara Jatta. <laughs> I'm asking all the panelists to turn on their cameras in turn so that the participants can see you on the screen. So, Ms. Jetta, you're the director of the Vatican Museums. You're the first woman in this position. You're an art historian and you teach at the Naples um, uh, uh, University. In 1996, you joined the uh, Apostolic uh, a library of the Vatican. Now we are going to Bogota to meet Ms. Juliana Restrepo, who is director of the National Museum of Colombia. Welcome, Juliana. You've been recently uh, named as director for this uh, museum. This was in uh, on the 9th of February 2021. So I believe you will uh, be basing yourself on the previous um, management project that you've been uh, heading, for example, in the uh, Medellin uh, Modern Art Museum, and also as the director of the Institute of Art. And here you, you set up several promotion and educative uh, programs and activities. And under your direction, the Medellin Museum uh, saw its number of visitors grow expo exponentially. And also thanks to the new vision that you gave this museum, it's, it was transformed from a, a more classical space to a more contemporary space, which is actually interesting because that's what we are, I'm trying to do the opposite in my museum, so we could speak about this later. And now we're going to Beijing to meet Xu Don Wang, who's the director of the Palace Museum. And you've been the director of, since 2019, and you are trained as an engineer, 
and you started your career as a conservator for caves and paintings. And in 1991, you joined the research academy that you became the director of uh, a few years later, and there you supervised the um, preservation of uh, the preservation of games that are listed in the UNESCO uh, heritage list. So, those are the five museum directors that will be speaking with us today, and will be speaking about two different. Uh, problems and issues uh, of this crisis. First is the question of the survival, the financial survival of our institutions. The figures we were given are quite scary. 6% of museums could actually disappear. 30% of them have to totally rethink their, their model, their financial model. And then the second issue will be our links and partnerships on the international scale. So we'll have two sets of questions, and then after those two sets of questions in which uh, each uh, participant will be able to reply in two or three minutes, uh, so as to foster dialogue and debate. And so after those two sets of questions, we'll have about 15 minutes left, during which uh, the panelists will be able to uh, uh, express their conclusions and also answer the um, questions of the journalists or um, of viewers. Um, but I'm afraid you will still think I'm speaking French, so you can you can just stick to the translation if, um, if anything. Um, I will start the, the first round of question with uh, Mrs. Barbara Elvin. Um, I hope uh, we can see you on, on the screen. Uh, so, as I just said, you director of the for the Asia Tissues Museum in Berlin, and your museum has just reopened on March 16, um, as many museums uh, actually uh, uh, in Berlin. So, um, with this long closure, closure since um, November, um, how did this reopening happen? What did it uh, make uh, for your staff, for your for your uh, programmation, for your activities, and also, uh, uh, more importantly, how are your your financially uh, um, and operationally um, uh, situation have been impacted by by this long closure? Well, I want to start by first saying thank you. I'm I'm very honored for being here. Thank you also for the very nice introduction. I'm speaking to you from Berlin, where currently it's snowing. Um, and we opened our museum indeed just two days ago, Tuesday morning, which even to us came as a surprise. We had long uh, expected to open on 1st of April and then the political rules changed uh, very rapidly and we were in the game. Uh, the experience, uh, just to judge from the comments of the visitors who are really now starved for going out and encountering culture, is that they indeed um, they are hungry to, to come to visit, to encounter the objects. So there is a, there is a huge um, enthusiasm on behalf of the auditory. So that's a very positive and also rewarding moment to live through. We have prepared for this second reopening. Um, we are already joking that we are getting a bit of practice because we had closed in March. We only opened in October. We reclosed in November. We opened this week. And we are frankly not all too optimistic that um, we will manage to stay open through April, depending on further developments. So we started last fall with putting a, a concept in place that considers how much space you need for visitors, how can you organize time slots, uh, one-way roads and all this. So I think this is probably the same in all the museums of the world. And uh, with the possibility to readjust after the first experience, we think this is going nicely and people comment saying that they feel much more safe than they would feel in a supermarket. So practically this runs well and we hope, we really hope and uh, that this 
can continue. Now, the question was on how has the crisis impacted us? And I think, um, first of all, I can state that as representing one of the 15 museums who are organized in the um, in the Staatliche Museen in Berlin, Berlin State Museums, um, under the umbrella of a large foundation, again, under the umbrella of the Ministry of Culture, we, we are in a super privileged uh, situation because this is supported by the government. So that means we can work. Uh, we do not have to lay off people immediately. We do not have to sell objects. And I strongly advocate that culture is something that the government should also feel responsible for supporting. Um, so we are in this privileged situation. Uh, nevertheless, a lot of our operational um, budget comes from the ticket sales and, and all these things. Of course, these have been strongly impacted um, and we have to react to this. Um, in the question I received in the briefing, there was also the, the question, how did the government react to the crisis? And again, there have been huge packages for support. And then there is a, is a strong inequality between the, the two veins. There is the publicly supported ones, and then there's the free artists and the free creative um, sector. Uh, we tried uh, as far as possible to team up with some people from the free market, so to say, by, for example, allowing music streaming events into our premises or uh, doing other things where we could at least make a little statement that we are also there for the public. And there have been, um, there have been many voices over the last weeks claiming that museums are really safe spaces. Museums are spaces for learning. And if it's not for making business, at least we could keep them and use them for education. Um, yeah, so yes, you use talking about safety. Uh, and uh, this safety as a cost, because actually uh, it's less uh, uh, incomes for museums, as you, say, as you said, uh, less visitors also, uh, less audiences, and, uh, and we have to adjust to make different conditions for, for safety and make the visitors feel safe in the space, and this as a cost also. Um, so how, how do you manage between uh, uh, both so, as I said, uh, our big privilege is that we are government uh, supported mm -hmm. and we see it as our duty that we contribute to education, that we contribute to the well-being of people, even though just by accounting, we pay more than we gain. But this is part of what mm -hmm. we consider to be our, um, just to be our duty for the society. And we try... We try to make up for this by, well, we po postpone some things that we consider to be less urgent. But um, on the other hand, we also have to acknowledge that we have a very generous support uh, from our government for these activities. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Tristram, I think that uh, the situation has been a bit different uh, for you in the Victoria and Albert Museum because you said that uh, this crisis uh, has been actually the, the most significant financial challenges for, um, for your museum. So um, I, I heard and I understand that the Victoria and Albert Museum have uh, think of different way uh, to adapt to this uh, financial crisis. So could will you share this with us? Um, well, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure um, to be with you. And I want to thank UNESCO and ICOM and yourselves. Um, Museums in the UK, we're, we're caught between the, the continental European model, where there is a great deal more state support, uh, as, as we've heard from Barbara, and then the American model, where there's big private philanthropy, and we have neither enough of one or the other. Um, so we are 50% funded uh, by the state, and then we make up the rest of our money through self-generated income, and we're good at this, exhibitions, uh, licensing, retail, catering. We're, we're very entrepreneurial uh, museums in the UK. But when you have a 90% fall in your visitor numbers, that leaves you uh, in a very, very difficult position. So what have we done um, over the last year? Crucially, we've tried to hold on to our members 
members are such an important part of our income stream because uh, not only do they give us money just as members but they they buy more things in the shop they're very thirsty they like coming to our cafe uh, and, and and restaurants uh, and then uh, in time they hopefully support us through gifts and legacies what we've also done is we license a, a great deal of our intellectual property so if you want to buy a william morris tea towel in tokyo uh, the VNA is there for you. And so around the world, we are kind of entrepreneurial. And our online shop uh, has done very, very well, even as we've been physically closed. But despite all of that, we now face a £10 million structural deficit uh, within the museum. And so we're in this very difficult and unwelcome situation of having to make uh, redundancies and cuts and restructures. So it's, it's a tough time, as you said right at the beginning, it's a really tough time for museums. Yes, okay, so but that's, those are quite creative ways also to, uh, that uh, I guess uh, our colleague from uh, uh, other museum can um, can take, um, that can be a good example actually to uh, to work with the members, to license um, uh, some products from the museum. Um, I, I will uh, ask Juliana how in uh, Bogota uh, the situation um, has been uh, dealt with, uh, because Juliana, you are actually also so um, uh, your national museum is also de a designated body uh, to guide and promote the implementation of uh, policies in the museum sectors. So uh, I guess you can have uh, uh, a view uh, which will be larger than the view of your museum. And you can tell us uh, about the gap and the inequalities uh, that, that the crisis has probably um, uh, increased in between museums uh, in Colombia. Thank you very much to UNESCO and ICOM and also I'm very honored to be sharing with all of you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Yes, so uh, in Colombia, museums were not prepared uh, to face all these challenges that came with the pandemic. Their financial capacities do not generally allow to allocate savings or have emergency funds to cope with this type of scenarios and very few museums had a fluid or solid cultural or educational digital offer. So uh, we, we found out that in Colombia, no matter the size, the capacity, or the general cost, all the museums were really affected by the pandemic. We carried out a survey. This was in April, last year in April, and the results gave us like a first image of the museum sector during pandemic when they were all already closed and when the country was already in an historical economic slowdown which clearly affected the cultural sector and obviously the museums so the main affectations remain and even increased during the year uh, and they were like financial issues changes in the program, in the cultural, educational and exhibitions program. And also uh, th there's a big issue with the lack of digital knowledge uh, from, the, uh, from the teams of the museums. So the situation presented uh, an important challenge uh, for all the museums, not only the, the national museum, but all the private museums in the country and also a commitment to the public. It was also the opportunity to make changes and take a leap towards digital to build all these programs in these new virtual environments and reach new audiences. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, it's true that the issue of uh, uh, digital in the museums has, has really uh, became uh, uh, more important now with the crisis when suddenly we had to close and we, we still had to, to reach out to, to our audiences. And uh, uh, some of us and probably many of us were not prepared enough to, uh, to deal with that. Um, I, I will ask uh, Barbara Jatta uh, from the Vatican, uh, director of the Museum 
at the Vatican Museum. Uh, uh, also, uh, what she can share with us uh, um, on this situation, on this financial situation, and also uh, on how you actually uh, make your environment safe when you um, uh, have six million people uh, a year to in, in a museum like yours. Uh, what are the challenges for, for safety um, uh, and what fin financial impact uh, it can have on your, on your institution? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank UNESCO to, to invite me and ECOM. Uh, I totally agree with, uh, on, with Alberto Garlandini's uh, uh, vision of, <laughs> of the near future of our uh, global museums. Um, we are in our third lockdown. The first one uh, was from uh, uh, March the 9th to June the 1st. The second one was from the 6th of November until the 1st of February. And now we start from last Monday, another lockdown. Very, uh, very different lockdowns in, in, in terms of what we have done. The first one we, uh, apart myself and and few other people of the staff, we, we, everybody was at home, but worked from home. Uh, um, in the second lockdown, we all stayed here, and, uh, but specifically in this one, more, more than the other, uh, other two lockdowns, we are all in presence because we, we are all vaccinated. And this is a very good news for, for the Vatican City State that uh, all our all the staff, all the people and relatives, uh, depending from, from the staff of the Vatican City States, have been already vaccinated, both uh, uh, Pfizer and both, <laughs> and both uh, vaccination. Um, it's a tough moment, as uh, uh, Tristan have said. It's a tough moment, uh, probably more than other museums, because uh, uh, our uh, condition is different from the state museum and from the American museum. We are totally uh, depending on our income from our tickets and more in, in, the, in the sense that uh, um, the Vatican Museum in some way helps the Vatican City, uh, the Vatican City state uh, uh, maintenance in, in a wide sense. So it's, it's really a complex and a tough moment. Uh, uh, the lack, uh, the lack of uh, of presence of visitors, but uh, what uh, we have tried to do in terms of security, in terms of um, uh, during the uh, the summer opening and during uh, the um, uh, this uh, second opening that we have done from the first of, of February, was to um, to really work on uh, security on safety. A thermal scanner, a digital thermal scanner were made together with the entrance uh, within the entrance. Uh, we have only online picketing in, and so this uh, can help uh, to to control the flu and mon monitoring the flu of our visitors. By the fact that uh, uh, we, are, we we were used to have uh, uh, more than twenty thousand people per day, and and. Uh, in the opening, we, we, we never arrived to, to that uh, number in the summer opening, of course, and nor uh, even much more or less in, in the, in the um, February opening. We, we had a lot of ventilation of room and spaces. Uh, we are lucky because we have many courtyards, we have gardens and we have seven miles of museum. So it's, it was easier to, to do that. But what we, we have done, we have worked a lot on digital implementations. Uh, that means uh, um, uh, with several other uh, major museum directors, we said that the digital and uh, econ probably can, can agree with that, that uh, at, in, a, in, a, in a strict lockdown, digital, digital is the real winner, but uh, in a long term, a digital cannot substitute the, the, <laughs> the real visit of the museum. But what we, we took the advantage of that time is to to work on many, many um, uh, projects and, and use this uh, uh, intelligent uh, the time uh, and the opportunity offered by, by this uh, time and complex situation. So we, we have done, uh, we update documentation on uh, restorations reports and uh, other projects that we would never, never have the, the time to, to do it because we were too, 
to taken by by a very fast uh, fast kind of work we uh, we we took the opportunity to make a lot of maintenance works uh, so that we were uh, un, 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 unable to do in in uh, in opening hours we were open many many hours a day uh, but in this time we we could do it in um, in a regular and uh, uh, time of of work and not uh, using extra works that are of course more expensive and uh, and during the night on during the, the Sundays, and so the, it was really it was really a good a good time just to slow down and think and work better with the staff. So in some ways, uh, of course, in a, in a very tough and dis dis disaster time, uh, there are some uh, some opportunities that uh, have come. Thank you very much, Barbara. I I'm sorry because at one point I got disconnected. <laughs> so ah, that's okay. Some of the technical problem. I could still hear you, but I had to to uh, fix that in the same time. So it was a bit uh, challenging. But thank you uh, very much for for your experience uh, on and that's also one of uh, uh, the issue we have to face is that we have to close we open and close and we open and this will uh, continue for a while um, uh, from Pekka, um i will now ask the same question of this financial issue uh, to uh, to mr wang um, so um in your case, your museum has been closed for uh, almost uh, um, 100 days. Uh, so I guess the, the challenges were even more different. So what can you tell us about your situation uh, financially and the impact on your institution? Thank you. Thank you for uh, your attention me to join uh, this very good meeting. Uh, as you uh, know, 2020 was a special year in human history as a pandemic brought uh, the world to a standstill. This stroke coincided with the 600th year of the Forbidden City. The imperial uh, palace of China, uh, China's Ming and Qing dynasty. How to deal with the pandemic threat, make effective adjustments and the changes, realize sustainable development and provide high quality services to the public. These have been our museum's priorities last year. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, the Chinese government has effectively balanced, balanced epidemic prevention with economic and social development, achieving decisive results in controlling the spread of the virus. As part of the effect, uh, effort to reduce spread of the virus, the Palace Museum closed in January 23rd, 2020. It reopened in May 1st after pandemic was under control in China. In addition to maintaining a real name system for ticket booking, we limited the daily visitors and the visiting hours. The visitor limit gradually increased from the initial 5,000 to 8,000, rising to 30,000 after October 1st. Our total visitor count dropped by 80%, 81% from 19.33 million in 2019. Uh, 19 to 3.58 million in 2020. Its lowest level in recent decades. Some of the exhibitions, academic seminars, and other activities scheduled for 2020 have also been canceled and all postponed. The ongoing pandemic has severely impact, uh, impacted the opening and the work of museums around the world. In China, to reduce spread caused by the movement of people, most uh, scenic sports and the museums temporarily closed, cutting revenues and funds sharply. 
and state-owned museums are supported by the government. We were, uh, we were spared from pay cards and uh, personnel layoffs. However, the pandemic still brought challenges to day-to-day -day operation, such as the reductions in administrative and the project budgets. To mitigate the pandemic's adverse efforts, we held online exhibitions, hosted live streamer events, and launched the multimedia online service, service platform, Cloud Tour Through the Forbidden City, allowing audience to view exhibitions, appreciate cultural heritage, and learn history at home. In April 2020, we invited people for the springtime walk inside the then closed Forbidden City via live streaming platforms, receiving over 450 million views. That was followed by a series of live streamed events showing the palace's unique charm through the succeeding seasons. In 2020, these events were viewed one billion times. Our museum's strict, strict pandemic prevention measures include asking visit, visitors to present health codes, measuring their temperature, and verify the tickets through the non-contact method. Visitors are asked to keep masks and on and practice social distancing with safety measures in place. In 2020, we held a special exhibition featuring paintings and calligraphy of the famous literature, Su Shi, and an architectural theme exhibition focused on the 600 year history of the Forbidden City. The measures in place have improved the visitor's experience and helped uh, liberate uh, the pandemic's impact. The daily visitor limit and the success of our online presence have also allowed us to gain valuable management experience and set the direction for future development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wang. Um, it's true that cancelling um, our activities has been uh, one of the worst um, uh, things we, we had to uh, deal with. And, uh, and the situation is that we, ca we kind of know what we will do in three years, but we don't really know what we will do in one month or uh, in six months. Um, and uh, it was really interesting to see also uh, the impact in numbers because the financial impact uh, makes sense also when you see the number of visitors uh, and the decrease of, of, the, of this audience. And, uh, and that's really one of the biggest um, uh, difficulty we have to deal with. Uh, now we will um, discuss uh, the second issue, um, um, the, the situation of partnership between uh, our institution around the world, uh, the link we can um, uh, make between our institution, but also the links we can uh, uh, make with uh, communities and uh, how we uh, develop um, partnership with communities also in this time of, uh, of COVID uh, and with all, with all those um, um, increase uh, restriction as uh, social distancing and uh, we can, uh, which can impact our work with communities. So uh, I will ask Juliana Restrepo from uh, Bogota uh, to uh, tell us uh, more about uh, um, the way uh, the, the different institutions uh, in Colombia um, as continue working with, uh, with museum community uh, and what was the impact on, uh, on this uh, inclusive work? Thank you, yes. I think the, the pandemic has shown us that there has never been a better time to collaborate. So uh, here in terms of solidarity, Colombia uh, 
Colombian museums are a very good example. Our country has 27 regional or thematic museum networks that are created to join efforts to support each other. It works all the year, not only, this is not only a pandemic um, thing, and they act as a solid and single voice when, negoti when negotiating with local, regional, or national uh, authorities or governments. They help each other and are based on the strengths of each museum. These networks also come together in a big table. We call it like a, the national table of museums. The table is basically used as a symbol of horizontal and equal participation and discussion in these networks. So as, as a coordinated group, this national table of museums sent a letter to the Ministry of Culture, letting them know about their main needs in these times and the risk of the beast of the pandemic, and also proposing ways to face them and solve them. So the letter asked for emergency funds first, and also for exceptions to be made so that they could use the public funds to cover administrative and staff costs. This is not normally allowed here in Colombia with public uh, funds. So their requests and proposals were very important, were, were a very important input to update the national policy for museums in the country. So this, this was like uh, something they, they, they made possible an ongoing process that is, uh, this is an ongoing process that is led by this strengthening of museums um, program that is run by the National Museum of Colombia. So some networks also came together to help each other in the preparation and writing of different projects to participate in calls. We had a call uh, named the uh, Museums Count, Los Museos Cuentan, um, and then that was launched by the Ministry of Culture for Common on Museums. So we created different calls for museums in the country and they, were, they all came together to send proposals, not just a proposal per museum, but in, in groups. The Art Museums of Colombia also joined efforts to help each other and to express to a national government how their permanent challenges or difficulties were dipped by the effects of COVID. This allowed them to share experiences and learn from each other as well. And finally, okay, they also uh, uh, came with crowdfunding campaigns. That was another uh, idea that came up. Uh, also this call, for participation of museums count promoted solidarity and collaboration among museums, because if the participants included as part of their project, a financial or technical support to another museum, then they will, will be receiving additional points and increase the likelihood of receiving these funds. Um, finally, I just want to add that this survey I was mentioning before of the museums and pandemic had an entry on solidarity that demonstrated that many museums run different programs to help affected citizens. And this was really important. Uh, now that this, this program we run, we, we run with, from the museum, the strengthening of museums program of the National Museum also organized in alliance with ICOM uh, and the Universidad Externado de Colombia in Bogota a series of webinars called Encounters, Museums in Reconstruction. And in these different encounters, we were dealing with different matters like how to open, how to reopen museums, how are museums workers being affected by the pandemic, how to tell stories in a world overloaded with digital contents and museums sustainability in a time of crisis. Thank you very much, Juliana. The, the question of support is, is, is really uh, uh, an important one. Um, and um, another issue uh, that we will uh, discuss now uh, with uh, Tristram Hunt uh, is the issue also of how we 
how institutions has kept working with um, with schools uh, because there is a big challenge there also um, uh, to keep safety and still uh, uh, we invent our, our way to work with um, with 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 schools. So um, uh, Tristram Hunt, uh, uh, will you tell us and share with us uh, what the Victoria and Albert Museum have? Um, uh, I think uh, uh, have, have invented to um, to actually keep his edu educational role. Lorella, of course. Um, for the VNA, this is this is particularly important for us because we we began um, as part of the what was called the design school movement. So education has always been absolutely central to the mission um, of this museum, using our collections to promote design. And even today, some 40% of our visitors describe themselves as from the creative industries. But we've got this real problem in English schooling at the moment, which is that the creative subjects, um, art, drama, music, um, are being stripped out of the curriculum as it becomes ever more kind of utilitarian. And the great fear with COVID was that not only do you have you know, nine months a year of computers on screen, not performing, not in orchestras, not uh, making pots and designing, that when they go back to school, the great onus will be on getting the basics right um, and catching up learning as if that broader process of learning and discovering through creative subjects has no role. So what we did was, was two things. One was to provide material online so that parents who were homeschooling during the COVID crisis could have fun and interesting and creative um, projects to work on with their children. And secondly, crucially, to support teachers. Teachers, we know, are the absolute key. Um, and the better the teacher, the more qualified the teacher, the more motivated the teacher, the better the outcome. And that's particularly important for children from disadvantaged backgrounds who might not have the parental support or the learning environment at home. So the teacher is key. So we put a great deal of our learning material online and supported the professional development of teachers during lockdown. So working with them on curriculum, working with them uh, on, on, on new teaching materials, working with them on classroom technique, that was what we felt was the, the best vehicle for us. And, you know, I hate this pandemic. This pandemic has been wretched. It's been a terrible year. There are very few good upsides um, to it. But having all of that digital material available to support the professional development of teachers is one of the good outcomes uh, and we can reach many more teachers now and we'll keep doing that thank you very much Tristram. and, and um, i guess that uh, the digital is also a, a good way for us to continue also partnership uh, international partnership with uh, with other institutions around the world. Uh, so Barbara Elving, uh, would you um, please tell us uh, how your institution has, um, has kept working uh, with other institutions and, and especially uh, you have a specific program of international cooperation uh, with Iraq, Syria and Turkey. Uh, so I guess there was a quite of a challenge there also for you. Um, so it will, be very, it will be very interesting to know uh, how this can continue. Yeah, thank you. Um, the challenge is there indeed, and um, I do not claim that we meet it all. Uh, I think I want to start with uh, saying that as the Museum of the Ancient Near East, uh, obviously our collaborating partners are located in Iraq, in Syria, in Turkey, in Iran, Lebanon, and these countries. And these countries have been even worse affected uh, by the COVID pandemic than we have. Um, so there are a few attempts on our side to maintain contact and maintain the cooperation. Um, one is a program, uh, or there are a whole number of programs, and I have to say upfront that this has most of this has been developed before I joined the museum, and it's uh, thanks to my colleague uh, Stefan Weber from the Museum of Islamic Art, who has initiated some of these. Um, one is the program that is uh, known under the name Multaka, which was initiated uh, shortly after the great um, 
refugee crisis uh, in 2015 came to Europe. And this was a program where young refugees uh, were, well, they learned how to be museum guides, thereby just encountering objects in my museum and in the Museum for Islamic Art that came from their home countries. So there was, first there was, it, initially there was this uh, making connections to the places where one is from, but this has developed extremely nicely. And um, the people who are active in Multaka now, they have developed um, online programs by themselves where they now offer uh, Arabic language uh, sessions uh, for people with Arabic as their first language living in Berlin and abroad. So this is very easy to open up. There have been a number of uh, programs on heritage preservation and on, um, on educational programs for young professionals. Everything has moved online. And as far as digital education, digital teaching, webinars, et cetera, as this works, I would say it's quite successful. All else, I have to confess, we are really holding back. We are preparing to be ready to go. Uh, well, once the moment comes that people can travel again. So there is a, there's a whole pile of stuff that's being prepared. Um, but then preparing, for example, funding applications for the next program just online is extremely difficult, um, in particular in countries where the infrastructure does not fully support all this online work. So we try our best and there are good possibilities and the young generation is super active in, in all of this and we have good responses for it. Um, and beyond that, we still wait for the moment when we can meet people face to face and meet colleagues face to face again. And um, have you been able to actually uh... Um, measure how, how many visitors uh, since uh, reopening? How many? In, in you mean? Phases. Uh, how many people have come to the museum since uh, uh, it has reopened? We have um, a strict um, policy of allowing one person per 40 square meters. So we are fully booked um, until um, end of next week or so. And it is, however, in the range between 500 and 600 every day. That's not uh, not comparable to what we had before, but that's the limit of what we can offer under the conditions of the pandemic rules. Okay, thank you very much. It's very interesting to see that uh, even with all those uh, limits, actually the audience uh, is responding to the to, to this reopening, and uh, um, the, the actual decrease is more due to the limits than to actually people being afraid of coming back to the museum or being uh, uh, um, absorbed by uh, by. In new thing, um, I will uh, ask uh, uh, Zudang Wang. Uh, we, we can go to Pekin now, uh, to Beijing, and uh, um, I know that your museum has a, also a long tradition of working uh, with uh, communities uh, and especially underprivileged communities. So uh, this uh, time of crisis has also been very challenging, challenging, I guess, uh, uh, to implement this kind of project. Um, so, uh, how um, uh, your museum uh, um, have been able to, to cope with, um, with this uh, crisis in terms of uh, working with those underprivileged community? Uh, thank you. Nowadays, museums are not only for collecting, storing, showcasing, and the research culture heritage. They are also social institutions providing the public with knowledge, education, and artistic enjoyment. The Palace Museum has been striving to serve society and its development and meet its wider responsibilities. Our museum has always adhered to the principle of benefiting the public, maintaining low ticket prices while expanding open areas in 2003, the Palace Museum started to offer free admittance and guide service to organized students group by appointment. 
We have so far received students and teachers from much of the country, especially those from remote and impoverished areas and the schools for migrant children. We have as provided free tours during off season for medical staff, volunteers, public security officers, and the teachers. In recent years, the Palace Museum has continuously innovated its exhibitions and the communication methods to appeal to younger audiences. Our official website has a special edition for teenagers, which tells stories in animation, challenger, stereotype uh, views of the Forbidden City, among its culture and creative products. Our museum has development, developed the series of uh, items that attract young people, such as these adorable cats and the apps such as the Night Rivals of Han Xizai, which employs digital technology to interpret cultural heritage and bring new vitality to traditional Chinese culture. In addition, our museum has held various public education activities and has paid special atten attention to the learning needs of primary and middle school students during the pandemic. A series of education programs were moved online, and we also launched video courses such as I'm going to Forbidden City and the solar terms in the Forbidden City, as well as the Forbidden City knowledge class web case throughout the year. Total views of this exceeded 60 million. We have been feeding the public with information about the public, uh, Palace Museum through our Chinese social media, Weibo account, and the Digital Forbidden City, we chat mini app. Our Weibo uh, followers exceeded 10 million, making our museum even more influential during the pandemic. We will use our influence to further meet our social education responsibilities and expand youth engagement. In the future, the Palace Museum will better coordinate offline and online work, accelerate the de deployment of the new generation information infrastructure, innovate the digital museum, construct a culture heritage database, and improve digital imaging uh, technology. And at the same time, more offline exhibition and the culture activities of higher quality will be launched so that the Forbidden City can be known and loved by still more people of different cultural backgrounds. This will promote exchanges and the mutual learning among different civilizations. Thank you very much, Sang Dun. Uh, so uh, now we will go to the Vatican uh, with Barbara. And uh, I have a question about cultural diplomacy uh, for you, uh, Barbara, because uh, um, we, we are in UNESCO. Uh, so this is a subject uh, <laughs> that we, we, we have to um, to discuss. Uh, so uh, would you be able to give us an example uh, of um, an outstanding cooperation that uh, uh, the crisis has not uh, actually impacted, that you, you have been uh, able to, um, uh, to continue uh, uh, throughout the, this crisis of uh, COVID-19? Um, of course, uh, the Vatican is a, is a a major museum, the Vatican Museums are, is an um, international museum and has uh, many, many international and cultural uh, contacts in a, in a wide sense. And uh, 
in the past, of course, I see uh, only in this uh, very short panel, I see many colleagues, uh, uh, the director of the Palace Museums or, or Tristan Hunt from the VNA with whom uh, we had uh, in, and we are uh, still having uh, contacts, but I also see uh, Mikhail Pietrovsky from the Hermitage. Uh, and so uh, we, we really keep going in terms of uh, exhibition and, and share exhibition with the Palace Museum. We, we expose in the Palace Museum in, uh, in Beijing uh, uh, a very um, selected by important um, exhibition on, on our uh, uh, Chinese collections. And they were supposed to, to expose in, uh, in the really the heart of the Vatican city state in the Braccio di Carlo Magno in San Peter Square they were supposed to, to expose. And, and for the moment that we, are, we had last year to postpone to this coming year. So we are now still keep going with this project. But with Chris, uh, Tristan Hunt in the VNA, the project on, on the, the tapestry of Raphael, of course, is keep going <laughs> uh, uh, together with the exhibition of, on, uh, of Raphael in, um, in the National Gallery in London. So in some ways, uh, of course, exhibitions, uh, uh, and even in the Hermitage, we, we organize uh, with the, the state um, Russians uh, museums, Hermitage and Tetakov Gallery, an exhibition in Moscow, and then uh, another exhibition here in the Vatican City State. Uh, and we are, uh, I see Mikhail Petrovsky, and we are still in aim of doing uh, something a very important on Leonardo in, in the Hermitage, but of course it, this has to be postponed. Uh, but uh, I see some a little light in, in this, uh, in this uh, not only diplomatic, but it's this uh, international uh, cooperation. Uh, today, um, a very important number of paintings from our picture gallery left the Vatican City to Warsaw. Uh, the exhibition uh, that uh, Warsaw and Poland uh, is devoting, was supposed to devote uh, to John Paul II, to the 100 years of the, uh, the, the date of birth of uh, the great uh, Saint Paul, uh, John Paul II, um, was postponed from last May to uh, the 23rd of March. And so we decided uh, to, to send the paintings without, uh, without a courier because uh, of the sanitary restrictions, but uh, uh, a courier from Poland came, the head of the conservation paintings uh, of, the, um, of the castle of Warsaw came and we, we fix it and we will follow uh, all the courier, courier and all the exhibition display uh, next uh, Sunday on uh, uh, via web. So the digital is helpful in this sense. Uh, and really we really decided that we want to send the paintings because Poland decided to, to open the exhibition. And so we didn't want to, to stop and we really wanted to, to go back to uh, uh, normality on, on, or even in, uh, if the pandemia is still, is still on, but we really try to, to, to do our best to do it in the better way. So digital is helping in, in, in this sense. But uh, cooperation has uh, already, Barbara Helwin was, was saying, uh, probably is more, or maybe was Juliana that was saying so, but uh, is, um, is really something that uh, uh, pandemia uh, teaches us that is something that we have to strengthen to reinforce. Thank you very much. Digital and support are the two key words uh, uh, for us to actually uh, cope with this situation. And we are probably going to cope with this situation for uh, quite a um, um, more time um, anyway. So this is a time for us to uh, open the floor uh, to all the um, colleagues uh, who have been uh, uh, following the, the panel, uh, uh, who have been listening to, to you, and, and maybe they want to ask questions um, and share uh, also experience with you. And it will be also uh, this moment, so we have uh, around 15 minutes where you can, um, when you can answer uh, the question 
questions coming from uh, from the audience, a colleague and journalist, uh, and uh, and also when you can uh, uh, make your um, conclusive remarks or uh, final comments um, on the also the future future of uh, what our institution can be uh, in um, not only in this time of crisis because um, this future is also uh, a way for us to to reinvent ourselves. So we are going to reinvent ourselves um, in a um, very uh, permanent way, in a way. Donc, so uh, um, this also this is also uh, the moment for you to, to to tell us about that. So I, I will try to find the question. Okay, no, this is. Um... Okay, um, I'm trying to find the question now. Okay, so uh, due to the COVID-19, the revenue of many European museums has decreased. Um, I wonder if museums in Europe will consider launching online sales of cultural and creative products in China, just as the British Museums has done. So I think that's one of the questions, but I don't really know who this question is um, directed to. I would like to maybe uh, um, answer to, to this I'm, question. I'm, ha I'm happy to speak to that. Okay, thank you, Tristram. Go ahead. Um, Yes, I mean we, we we know there's a there's there's a large um, and growing audience in in China for um, great museums um, and great Western European museums, and so we have a number of um, kind of social media partnerships um, with um, with Chinese firms to make sure our, our collections are seen. Um, we link through to our shop and some of our kind of retail activities as well. But we, what we also have is, is a permanent gallery in, in, in Shenzhen. Uh, we, we work with an organization called Design Society in, in Sheku in Shenzhen, where we tell the story of the history of design um, in Shenzhen, which is obviously a UNESCO uh, uh, design city. Um, and for us, it seems a very v &A way of thinking about this, that, that the v &A came into being uh, during the, the Industrial Revolution and its aftermath when Britain was thinking about the importance of industrial design and applied design. Uh, and as China begins this design revolution and invests much more in education and creativity and design, um, us being there um, in those communities makes sense for us. So, and we look forward to more partnerships like that in the future, particularly uh, at a time when political dialogue is sometimes more complicated. Thank you very much. Um, so we have another question from uh, George Abangu. Um, uh, hello, George. Um, so um, you, I will just read your question now. We have heard that 50% uh, of museums have got no funding from governments during pandemic. Um, is that not a wake up call to ask museum relevance? If museums were so relevant, would that be the case? Um, if museums were standing for the rights of communities, taking into consideration people's well-being and welfare, would this be the case? Communities vote in governments, and no institution can be wrong if they are with the communities, the people. Is it not time to rethink and reinvent the museum and its role? If not, will museums survive? So thank you, uh, George, for this question. It's almost a new panel that you launch in now. We can have a, a, a very long discussion, I think, around those issues. Uh, but uh, the relevance of museums for communities uh, being um, uh, a way to to secure their financing that, that's the question and, and i and i don't know if uh, juliana maybe uh, would like to to answer this question uh, or, or or maybe so, some uh, someone else sure just um, of course museums will survive i think that that's a must uh, i think that um uh, Becoming digital museums was not easy for any of us. I think we're all kind of a type of new digital analog museum because um, even the big museums here in Colombia were, were I must say, were 
analog. So museums had to uh, take like an extreme and immediate turn to digital to keep their doors open to virtuality. And this was positive. And I think, uh, and, and now I'm taking some words from uh, Mr. Jarlandini. Uh, I think this was positive and demonstrated not the digital capacities, but the innovation and creativity capacities that we as museums have. And I think we will survive because of that and we, and we have to do it. I think currently the challenge, at least here in Colombia for museums, and, and this has to be with the question you just uh, uh, made before, uh, I think the challenge, one of the big challenges consists on how to monetize all these new digital bunch of activities and programs and products that we are launching because at the beginning, we, they were free for everyone, at, at least here in Colombia. So now we have to begin monetizing all these activities. And I think this is going to be hard for the audiences to, to understand it. But I think that the museums will have to explain this in terms of sustainability and keeping obviously the same policy of having di di different charges for the different audiences. Thank you very much, Juliana. Uh, so I have another question from Diana Marie Babli. What uh, I have to read it from my phone. Uh, so sorry. What will be your recommendation for a new museum which is currently in the process of being set up in view of rethinking strategies, accessibility to collection and audiences? Uh, who would like to, to answer this question for a, a new museum? coming up and, uh, and trying to rethink uh, its strategies. Maybe Barbara Alvin? Can you hear me? I, I guess I, it looks like I have a problem. No. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's, it's very good chance to <laughs> share with uh, uh, every colleague. The pandemic uh, has changed the way uh, museums connect with their audience. Uh, looking to the future, working method and priorities must be adjusted accordingly to accelerate the shift to digitalization. Uh, uh, information based and the smart museums. Compared with physical museums, digital museums can serve a wider public, expanding from district and city to nation and globe. In the future, our museum will continue to explore more combined online and offline working methods, enhance its uh, always, uh, awareness of humanized uh, care, and focus on its mission to promote education effort. Uh, the Palace Museum will always stand in solidarity with our international colleagues, and we will strive to overcome challenges and make uh, unremitting efforts to protect and uh, inherit the common culture heritage of mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this uh, closing remarks. Uh, so maybe uh, Barbara Alvin, you would like to make your closing remarks to, to this panel. Thank you. Well, I think you will continue. So closing is a bit early, but I think the crisis is really a very, very good and necessary opportunity for all of us to learn. And we have engaged a lot in the digitalization of objects, in the digitalization of knowledge. Nevertheless, I wanna emphasize that museums, I think, and should be in the future, are places of encounter, of contact, of communication, of dialogue. And in a way, we need to maintain this focus. And I think also it's a call, um, the crisis is a call for us to rethink if we really want to have a just 
mass tourism and blockbusters and if we want to rely on this or if we want to maybe also conceptualize differently in a way to reach out to local audiences who otherwise have not been or have not felt so much addressed by the museums so far so i think there's a lot for us ahead to learn and i'm grateful for hearing so many different perspectives here that i'll take certainly with me thank you Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Barbara Jata from uh, Vatican, would you like to, uh, to make your closing remarks? Uh, of course, I agree with Barbara that um, pandemia has teaches us uh, many, many issues that we were not supposed to, to consider. And so we, we take advantage of that. Uh, I'm sure that the balance uh, will be between the, the digital, of course, um, in, uh, improvement, but also uh, as, as we are a large museum with a, with a, uh, we, and a universal in some ways uh, museums, we, we really think that the, the very important issue is to come back. So the digital can help, as Tristan said, in terms of education, in terms of uh, uh, implementing the, the knowledge of what is, uh, I, I, I don't want to, to call it experience, but what is really the, the way of uh, reaching and, uh, and, uh, and visit uh, the, 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 the museums. So I am I'm really convinced that is in between the balance of uh, the digital and the presence that uh, will be our future, our future. Of course, the digital, it's helpful. Is it in some ways is is, uh, is uh, indispensable, but it never will never substitute the real uh, visit of uh, of uh, uh, the museum. Thank you very much, and I will give the floor now to Juliana to give uh, your closing remarks. Yes, I, I completely agree with you, Barbara. On the digital thing, this is we are we are looking forward to the complete opening of museums here in Colombia, uh, the reopening of Museo Nacional de Colombia, and also all the 468 museums in the different regions of the country. So, uh, and I, I think we have to keep this, the faith, and also we are responsible of uh, moving people to keep the faith. And we're going to make it. And Thank I think you, Juliana. <laughs> and now, uh, Tristram, if you would like to uh, make the final closing remarks for this panel uh, with um, uh, the v &A, uh, uh, experience and vision for the future. Laurella, thank you. And thank you to all your colleagues. Um, it's, it's been a really rich um, conversation. I, I think what the last year has shown is that what we do is more important than ever. Um, I, I think during lockdown around the world, as people felt dislocated, not only from our, our objects and our artifacts, but the sense of community, the sense of a, of, of a civic place whereby you can discover you know, the unknowable, whereby you are challenged, whereby you're engaged. And we, we, we've spent too much time sitting at home, following algorithms, being told what to think and how to think. And through social media, having our uh, prejudices confirmed rather than challenged, uh, being told to like things we already like. And the whole point about a museum is that you you wander from different space to idea uh, to people. Um, and I just think in terms of citizenship, um, our role not only as museums of art or design or anthropology or cultural religion, but our, our, our civic role um, has been shown to be more important than ever in its absence uh, over the last year. Uh, and we at the VNA uh, look forward to opening on the 19th of May, which seems so far away. Uh, but uh, when it comes, we, we are very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much and, uh, and good luck for this uh, reopening uh, 
um, to come. Uh, so I, I will give uh, thank you very much to all of you for your, your uh, for this discussion, for uh, all the ideas you have shared with us, uh, and uh, and I think it it will be really. Uh, um, uh, nourishing in a way for um, all our, our colleagues uh, around the world. Um, I will give back the floor to Lazar Elundu now uh, um, to actually continue uh, our discussion with the second panel. Merci beaucoup, uh, uh, cher uh, Lorella. Uh, Thank you very much, Lorella. Uh, Thank you for moderating with so much success, this first panel, which was very interesting and rich. I think what we could remember from it is that without any consultation from the panelists, we actually could see there were the same messages and the same commitment, and also the same vision on the strength of museums during the pandemic period, and how also museums had to learn to adapt to remain close to the public. And thank you very much to, to have explained all this. Thank you, Lorella, and thank you to all of you from uh, we, we really learned a lot during your first discussion. And now after this first panel, I will introduce the second panel, which is about the future of museums. And the president of the panel will be Emmanuel Casareu, is the president of the Quai Branly Jacques Chirac Museum here in Paris. I think uh, Emmanuel, every, everyone knows uh, Emmanuel. He's a historian and archaeologist. He's worked a lot in New Caledonia on the cultures of the Pacific region. And Emmanuel is also very much known because he was the director of the Chibawi Cultural Center in Numia, New Caledonia. And then in 2011, he joined the Quai Branly Museum, where he continued to work with the passion and that characterizes him and he's been the president of this museum since 2020. So I give the floor to Emmanuel for the second panel. Thank you very much to have accepted to be the moderator. Hello to all my colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, seen some of the colleagues that I actually know. For example, Lorella, it's my pleasure and my honor to moderate this panel today. I thank, the, I thank UNESCO for this initiative. So I will be moderating the second panel um, after our first discussion on the impact of the COVID crisis, we will be thinking about the future, we'll be envisioning the future of museums in the post-COVID COVID era. So already many things have been said, and I believe some will be repeated during this session. And hopefully also there will be new insights and also new questions. Uh, some older questions are still present and still need to be addressed, for example, uh, about uh, the public, the capacity we have to liaise with the public, uh, how the public can be diversified, and then how to uh, speak to so many different audiences and wide audiences, also what tone we should use. And do we need to remain outside of uh, the current news and current affairs, or we, do we need to be to give an echo to the news? Also, how can we use new technologies? So, and, and to what extent should we use uh, those new technologies? Some of them actually propose to uh, totally um, 
uh, replace the reality of physical museums. And also we have to see how museums can actually think on their uh, environmental impact, uh, how their operations impact the environment. So that's many questions that I believe will be uh, touched upon today by our five different panelists. So I will introduce them. First, Mr. Antonio Sabaret, who has been since 2013 the director of the National Museum of Anthropology of Mexico. In 1990, you started to work for the National Institute of Anthropology of History, and then you directed this institution for several years. You're also a member of the Academic Council of the National Museum of Art. And you also have a PhD in history. Our second panelist is, uh, comes from Dakar in Senegal, Mr. Hamadi Bokoum. is the director of the Museum of Black Civilizations which opened in 2018. And I actually attended its uh, opening. You're a researcher, you're an archaeologist, and you've also been the director of the Fundamental Institute of uh, Black Africa. Then our third panelist is Ms. Deborah Mack. So you have been working since 2020 as the interim director of the National Museum of African Arc of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. You were the at the head of uh, strategic partnerships for the National Museum of uh, African American Culture. And between 2012, you worked as an independent consultant on museums and exhibitions. And you're also the member of several uh, museum organizations. For example, the African American Museum Organization. Our fourth guest today is uh, Mr. Mikhail Piotrowski who is a, a general director of the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, where you've been, well, actually heading since the since 2012. You've also organized uh, exhibitions in Yemen. And since uh, your arrival at the Heritage, you've really worked on its uh, international opening through uh, very important uh, uh, blockbuster exhibitions. You've also written more than 250 scientific works. And then our final panelist is Ahmed Farud Gonaim. You're the executive director of the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization in Cairo. I can't see you, but I believe you're here. You, uh, you also work at university. Hi. You are a specialist in economy and political sciences. You have been consultant for many international organizations, WHO, the World Bank, World Bank, uh, the food program, and you've had a diplomatic activity since you were cultural advisor of the Egyptian embassy in Berlin. Well, welcome to all the colleagues. We're going to launch this panel which as for the former one will be in two rounds of questions at the end of the panel we have 15 minutes to allow each of you to make their final conclusions and that will be the moment when 
we will also give access to the public to put questions to us. Uh, we have different participants listening to this uh, conference, and I'm here addressing the participants. You will have the possibility to put your guest questions through the question and answer box at the bottom of your screens. So. I have the pleasure now to start this first round of questions with a question to Mr. Ahmed Farouk Ghanayim, director of the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. This musician was to open in April 2020, and the Egyptian government has announced has announced it would delay the opening of the museum. Your museum is uh, for the time being closed, but you will tell us whether it is the case or not. The opening was delayed to 2021 because of the pandemic. What is the vision of your museum? How did the pandemic influence the renovation process, the work, the preparation work? which you are undertaking before the opening of the museum, what changed and what remains the same? You have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the chair and thanks for inviting me uh, to be part of this panel. It's a pleasure to be among you. Uh, in fact, uh, just going directly to the two questions and how did the pandemic affect our preparations? Uh, I can tell you that uh, in our case, it didn't affect it that much for a simple reason is that most of the construction work has been already there. Maybe it has slowed down a little bit uh, in, in just uh, some of the teams were affected by the pandemic or uh, as a matter of precautionary measures to slow down uh, the, the number of people being involved in the museum but as a preparation for opening, it didn't delay us by any means, because as I said, most of the construction work has been already uh, done in our case. Uh, yet the pandemic affected the opening, as uh, you rightly said, uh, that it was uh, supposed to be open in December, uh, but uh, due to the, the COVID-19 effect, uh, the, since the, the, the opening will be by the president of Egypt uh, himself, and uh, just to avoid uh, the crowds, uh, especially that the mummies will be uh, in a parade moving from their place now to, uh, to, to come to the museum here, it was uh, postponed. Now, what we are actually planning for is that it is going to open in a very uh, few weeks, I would say a number of days, and uh, taking care of the, all the precautionary measures and being opened by the president himself, where he will be waiting to welcome the, the mummies, the 22 mummies, 18 of them are, uh, are uh, we're talking about kings and queens, and then the, 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 the museum will open up for the public the day after, taking into account all the necessary precautionary measures. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, uh, the answer to the question that has been raised. Thank you very much uh, for that information. Many of us are waiting for the opening of the new museum. We are all eagerly expecting this opening. Uh, my second question goes to Mr. Hamadi Bokum, director of uh, the Museum of Black Civilizations in Dakar, in Senegal. Dear Hamadi, there is a new generation of museums uh, being opened in Africa. They bring uh, new vitality and creativity to the continent. The Museum of Black Civilizations is still a young museum, as it was inaugurated in 2018. I remember this event. Other museums are being created, uh, such as the Palais of Lomo in Togo, opened in 2019, the new 
Intercontinental Museum on Slavery in Mauritius in 2020, and many other museums, such as the Great African Museum or the Great Egyptian Museum, which we've just heard about. So how do you see the future of African museums and their role for Africa, Hamadi? All uh, the institutions in the world, uh, although some of them are centuries old, are facing questions about their mere existence. It's quasi-existential questions for some of those museums. So how can one accommodate everyone? Can new institutions such as yours provide new answers, new approaches to such uh, old questions, if I may say so? Hello to you all. Please allow me to start by thanking UNESCO and ICOM for launching this meeting. I do hope you hear me well. Yes, yes, we hear you very well. Yes, we hear you well. Thank you, says uh, Mr. Bokum. I would like to start by a first question. The title of our panel is What Future for Museum in the Post-COVID Era? And the question is the following. When we speak of an era, we speak about a period of time. And if we question this timeline, we must say, when does the post-COVID era start? Or when did it start? Are we still in a COVID era or are we no more in the COVID era? And this question is absolutely vital. Uh, with all the upheavals, changes, uh, some of us uh, think that we're playing yo-yo with uh, the COVID. Now, to get to the questions you have raised, which are very important, are the new uh, direction of Museums for Africa is an open question. It does not only concern African museums, but all museums of the world. We have to reinvent uh, museums in Africa. And you and Lorelei, who's with us today, and we cannot hear you anymore, says the moderator. Can anyone hear Mr. Bokum? We seem to have lost Hamadi. I think we've lost Amadi. He's got a technical problem. Let's try and connect him again. But in the meantime, you can continue the discussion with the other speakers, with other panelists. Yes, I do hope he will uh, find his digital voice once again to continue this march with us. I would like to put a question to Ms. Deborah Mack. I'd like to remind everyone that your interim director of the National Museum of the African Art is in the Smithsonian Institution. Your museum, contrary to that of Amadi, is closed as is mine today. A question on inequalities. This is a crucial question in our day and age. Uh, this inequality which existed before the pandemic is increased by the pandemic. And uh, last year, some institutions were attacked in the US because they did not take a strong stand uh, as a symbol of societies that tolerate inequity. So what is to be done when we know that the George Floyd trial is opening? and that identity conflicts uh, have uh, developed throughout the world. So how can we do to learn or unlearn? Uh, what are the most important lessons we can draw from this period following this identity situation? You have the floor. Uh, before I begin, uh, like my other colleagues, I wish to thank ICOM and UNESCO 
for inviting me to participate and represent the National Museum of African Art. Uh, you have rightly pointed out what we in the US are referring to as really a double pandemic. A pandemic not only in terms of the medical issues around COVID, public safety, health, and the issues that uh, impact the Smithsonian um, and all museums, but also the, the, the heightened racism and the really truly public reckoning with systemic racism. The Smithsonian is basically involved in both of these issues. We feel you are, we are not in one without the other, that these are both essential issues um, in terms of whom we serve, why we exist, and we are taking measures both internally. Um, I can reference the National Museum of African Art, but in doing so, because this museum is one of 19 in the Smithsonian system, that also includes eight research centers, it has over 6,000 employees, and, and when we are not in pandemic, an, an additional 6,000 volunteers, interns, fellows, research scientists, this is a public issue, and if we are part of the national footprint, we have to address this as well. Those, there are multiple levels of, in which we are addressing it, uh, not only internally, where all of our museums are working internally with our staffs, but working across as a director, we are in literally weekly meetings and shared collaborations in data sharing. We are working with our publics, our specific audiences and our stakeholders and our partners both within and outside the United States to understand, to listen and better understand how we can have impact. Um, as with many of the other institutions, we have slowed down where we can um, to really better align and examine how we operate, what we do, how we do it, and how our operations internally reflect the ethics that we should represent. But most importantly, we have reached out to our partner museums and to our publics around the country to listen and understand what we can be doing better to support and strengthen them, whether they are, these are teachers, these are caregivers at home, these are the homeschoolers, they are the aged. We see a, specifically a lot of isolation among older people and seniors. The Smithsonian has been very successful historically in reaching large urban areas but we are now focused on small communities, small towns and rural areas. We are very aware of the digital divide. Like many other museums, we pivoted immediately to digital resources and sharing, but we are now in a second wave of examining where we can reach and what is useful, but also who we do not reach. This double pandemic has also heightened, as you've noted immediately, the, the ongoing systemic inequities in our society, especially those around race. Um, our brown and black communities have been adversely, even more profoundly impacted by COVID and by lack of access to, to many of these resources, including digital resources. Um, one of the major Smithsonian wide initiatives is that we've already launched. Uh, it's called Our Shared Future, Reckoning with Our Racial Past is a Smithsonian wide initiative that is reaching out in partnership across the nation over the next five years to really confront the historical roots and the contemporary impacts of race and racism in the United States and beyond. Um, this is accomplished through interdisciplinary scholarship, creative partnerships, local engagement, as you can see at all of these levels, but it seeks to really spark change and unity and healing in building a more equitable future in which museums are intrinsically involved. We have really this initiative structured around six major content pillars. They address issues of wellness, wealth, ethics, race beyond the United States, and of course, museums and public representation, because we want to make, in a sense, systemic racism feel knowable to the average citizen to feel relevant to people's everyday lives, and most importantly, to feel changeable. And then we believe that every person has a racialized identity 
or multiple racialized identities, and that the movement for racial justice is has always been for every single one of us, no matter where we are. The work that our museums are doing internally is to pivot more effectively to be aligned with those goals. And so uh, this is comparable to what I'm hearing from many of our other colleagues, but we have in a sense, this double issue that we are dealing with that one is not separate from the other, that they are intertwined and that is how we're proceeding on both fronts. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive answer, which also covers the social and political dimension of museums. I would like to move from Washington back to Senegal, as Hamadi Bokum, uh, whom we had lost uh, because of the cloud, is back with us. Hamadi, you were speaking about the emergence of the new museums in Africa, and you said that it was necessary to reinvent the museums for Africa. Can you please continue? I'm sorry for this uh, interruption. I was saying that we have to create a new generation of museums. A few decades ago, we identified this need and we took this direction and to create this new generation of museums, we have to open up. We have to be informed within our culture, but beyond our borders. We have to listen to the rest of the world. And this is what we have done in the preparation conference, which you, uh, Emmanuel, have uh, chaired. And this is what is happening throughout Africa. There will be one African museum, but there will not be one model of African museum. We will think museums differently, and it's in this plurality that we will find and hear the African voices. We all know that ethnographic museums have very little support. And how can we welcome everyone in our midst? You cannot welcome someone if you don't know how to speak this person. I often give this example. My mother never set foot in a museum. And the day we present the Ashman, uh, she said, I'll come to the museum. And she came with all the women of her age who were her friends. And I believe that it is important to present to the public things that interest them. I'll speak about it more in details when we will speak to the young people afterwards. The other question is that despite the importance of the digital, I mean, the digital is very important, uh, new technologies, it's uh, orality, because you talk more than you write, you look, you see, and that is important when you see the penetration rate of the cell phones in Africa, everywhere in Africa, you see the depth, but the conformity between the uh, instrument and the message. So speaking the language of one's times is to invest uh, massively in the digital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dehamadi. I like the idea of the revenge of the orality that will go through the digital and that um, uh, you know, makes for a good transition to the question that I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Antonio Sabori, who's the director of the uh, National Museum of Anthropology, uh, Mexico. It's an open museum. Uh, well, uh, that I envy for. It was the uh, National Museum of Anthropology was the first to deploy augmented reality for its exhibitions. It also launched after a major digitization project uh, uh, to create a first high resolution digital image bank of the museum's collections. It, according to you, uh, how do you think the digital offerings interact with the tours and activities in uh, situ? How have the digital resources contributed to the different activities of the museum and benefited? 
the public. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, first of all, I would also like to thank UNESCO and ICOM for ICOM for the invitation uh, to share some of our thoughts uh, about the future of museums. Uh, focusing on your uh, question, Emmanuel, uh, I think that uh, digitizing has helped us to open the museum. It is uh, paradoxical nowadays, uh, during these days, although I think also as a Amadi, I don't know where we are right now, before, in, or after pandemic or COVID uh, atmosphere, or when the post pandemic uh, will begin. But uh, I think that the, this process of digitizing our collections has helped us above all to, to open the doors uh, of, of the National Museum of Anthropology to, to, the, to the world. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, to, the, to research. I'm not so sure uh, uh, about, and I'm not so confident of, uh, uh, of the benefits of these tools in schooling or uh, uh, in this part of, the, of our mission, which is educational. But uh, above all, it, during, this, during these months, but uh, this digitizing process will help us in the future to, to keep, keep a connection with the rest of, of the world. During the last uh, months, we have learned to take the most or make the most of our checkered screens. And we have been in a, uh, in a, in a very active process of communication among us, uh, people in working in and for the museums. And I, and I do hope that this, this communication process will continue in after, after the pandemic. Uh, it'll, we are working uh, more uh, in, I, I, I don't know how to, to say it, uh, working together in the construction of future projects and uh, sharing our experiences nowadays that we are locked uh, uh, in our own countries. So uh, I, I think that uh, in the horizon uh, that I would like to see is, uh, uh, is, um, is uh, it's a world more, more uh, the world of the museums much more connected, sharing experiences and sharing responsibilities and continuing our mission as a, as a, as a very important, a very important space for, for our citizens. As Tristan said just before, uh, to enhance the civic role of the museums. No? Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you, thank you very much, Antonio. Your answer brings me to the digital issue. I see a certain number of questions coming up on the use of new technologies in museums. And my question now is for you, Mikhail. Piotrowski, Director General of the St. Hermitage Museum, St. Petersburg. That is uh, lucky to be open. Last uh, November, amid the second wave of the COVID-19, you uh, succeeded in bringing together over 1,600 artifacts from museums in Germany and Russia for an exhibition called Iron Age, Europe Without Borders which is uh, quite a difficult uh, thing to do at a time when the borders were closed. 
And uh, during the uh, virtual opening ceremony of this exhibition, you said that learning brings people closer, uh, which corresponds to your long-standing belief in the role of the museums in the field of intercultural exchange and understanding. I think we'll have to still wait a while before this exhibition can travel and that uh, we you know freely be able to go to our museums so the question is in your opinion what are the new uh, the new strategies of exhibitions to be adopted so that the museums be become without borders and strengthen the cultural cultural dialogue that is so important for you Museum is a museum if even if there are no visitors. Everybody must understand it. Another thing is that museums doesn't belong to us. They belong to the former generation and for the future generation. We're just keepers, so we must not be too selfish in deciding things. And museums certainly are bridges. All this have been, and they're very important bridges now. The world is falling apart. And museums is maybe the last bridge which will keep us together. And what we must do, we must make the traffic going through these uh, bridges in and out. And there are different ways of doing it. We have done several exhibitions during pandemic to bring two, three works, four works. Uh, we have done for our Rafael exhibition, we have works from England. We have big Chinese exhibition in Hermitage, just in the middle between the two ways. We sent uh, Tiepolo to uh, Finland and so on. We got Cartier jewelry in Paris, from Paris. Uh, the problem is that now we are living in a situation like with Netronic bone. The objects travel. For people, it's much more difficult. And But we must keep the human part of this uh, art exchanges. We are discussing a lot in the museum community, the couriers, digital checking, it's okay. But without couriers, without keepers of the objects, because they're responsible for the subjects, they're not just register their response of all these objects in their museum. No, it must, and it's the human relations. You have human relations with objects and human relations with which uh, together with, with us. So we, and we're solving every day, we're solving these problems. Uh, we have to think about our exhibitions. They must be very intellectual. So they'll appeal to the people who are very much digitized and know a lot. They must be intellectually, uh, intellectually maybe provocative. We have a beautiful exhibition on Raphael. It's called After Raphael. Uh, it's the best exhibition in uh, Russia in this year was visited. It's about Raphael uh, pandemic, about Raphael virus in the art history in the world. There are not many Raphael. There are very few Raphael. There are Raphael to Hermitage, but we have, uh, have uh, shown the whole history of world art and the influence of Raphael and his well virus. That's one thing. Another thing we are provocative uh, showing jewelry exhibitions, Cartier together with Fabergé, together with old jewelry and discussing the, the how the museum who show which show jewelry has to deal with the uh, market and market uh, ethics, which are very different from museums. Well, that's, uh, so we have to play somehow with digital and online and offline, not a balance, just to bring sometimes more of this, sometimes more of that. So that will be, it's a tool and also a toy. Well, we have to uh, well use it for um, our benefit, just to make things more understandable. And another thing, we have to show our collection deeper, big collections, small collections, and we must make our collections point of discussion. Because museum is a place for discussion. It's not a place, it's teaching, but it is a very good teacher, very democratic teacher museum is. So, we now opening exhibition now during the pandemic we open an exhibition of icons well the religious art is a wonderful thing to look at when you are in pandemic and it's also a very important discussion where religious art must be in museum or in the church and we are discussing it we are opening a new exhibition renewed exhibition of caucasus caucasus is a bomb as you remember and from the point of view of different memories and wars of memory and we are uh, facing it we are discussing the history we are showing and making museum display place where you can discuss. Uh, we are showing on big scale, mostly most of the paintings which you have in Hermitage. Now we have some space, which usually it's not a good thing for the museum to show good things. Now we're trying to show 
People are always asking about reserves, reserves. Now see these reserves, go kilometers, tens of kilometers, and see what is better to have choice and temporary exhibitions or some of displacement. So these are things which maybe are good in this uh, time to, well, to stress. Thank you. Je vous, je vous merci, uh, nous, nous Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, we've come uh, to the end of the first round of questions. I, I come now to the second round of questions. And uh, we already have a lot of questions coming in through the screens from the participants from the public that has joined our discussion and the official hashtag is hashtag UNESCO, share culture, hashtag share culture and hashtag uh, COVID-19. I see these many questions. I think we'll take them uh, towards the end, but uh, coming to the second round of question and changing the order of the speakers of the panel, starting with Deborah Mack, uh, uh, the National Museum of African Art. Uh, the museums are places where objects, collections are displayed, but they're much more than that. Could you tell us your approach? You already explained it, but uh, making the link with the social role of the museums, but tell us about your approach so that the museums remain essential to societies, uh, to, to what is essential and what isn't, and how can the museums remain essential in the eyes of the society and in periods of crisis, and that the exchanges that you establish with the communities and how uh, museums could extend their way of uh, working beyond their walls to better serve the society and especially the young generations. One of the well-known um, sayings that we have um, in the American museum system is that, um, especially over the last 50 years, 30 years, 20 years, we recognize that really museums are really not about something, they should be for somebody. And that means that whatever the focus of the museums are, the collections, one of the first issues that we, in terms of our practice currently have, is that we ask our visitors and we ask our non-visitors, what do they need? How do they need it? What would be essential for them? We believe at this time that uh, especially for a Museum of African Art in the United States, I personally feel and our staffs agree, we need to be perceived as essential to our community needs, to educators, to families, to individuals, to people who are looking for links of their, around their past or around their present and shaping their future. One of the ways in which we are accomplishing this is by reaching out through our established networks with educators, with schools, with home caregivers, and of course, importantly, with our members. But we are also in the middle of conducting new audience research, what I would consider comprehensive audience research, to find out, especially for younger audiences, um, how they perceive the museum, how they want to connect with the museum. Those audiences, especially in the United States and in the Washington, D.C. area that are local, we now have a very large, very globalized, for instance, African diaspora audience, which is very different than even 20 years ago. We've always had globalized audiences in the DC area. However, what we see now is similar, but also very different. And we have to ask what those needs are, how those links should be, what kinds of, uh, of exhibitions, programs, services we should be providing. This is something that's not just confined to, for instance, exhibitions and what our curators do, our museum educators. And in the United States, the museum educators and public program staff are in many ways the eyes and window of the museum to the publics. Um, 
and they inform when we meet and in, in to develop our work, it's not just a curator or a curatorial team. It is our frontline visitor staff. It is our volunteers. It is our technical and digital people and staffs. Um, we all meet because we bring different perspectives and different voices. We not only meet internally, we meet externally with different small groups and delegations. During COVID, this has become somewhat different in that much of this communication is digital, but for the, with the possibility of enhancing our digital platforms, we are finding that during the COVID period, because we have had to slow down our processes, for instance, of exhibition mounting, uh, courier work, as our colleagues have been referencing, it's also given us more time to, in some ways, through digital means, communicate more intently, more in a more focused manner. And in many ways, this digital, for this, this circumstance of closure because of the pandemic has leveled the playing field. We are in much more consistent communication with our local audiences and regional audiences, and in particular with our African colleagues and museums around the world, around the country, around the world that have these kinds of goals and aspirations and collections and comparable um, programs. So we are finding, we are in the middle still of investigating how we can best be responsive. Uh, Smithsonian is a very large system and is more, is better resourced than many. But that does not mean that we know everything or are the lead. Smithsonian's position is that it learns best by listening and by working with across in partnership. I'm very gratified to hear from the examples of colleagues how many collaborative partnerships are informing not only how things are done, but what, what programs are done, how communication is happening, uh, the selection of exhibitions. I believe that this partnership is totally essential as we all know, we're stronger when we work together. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a wonderful uh, advocacy for partnership, especially the pandemic has marked as the first panel said the fragile nature of certain uh, museums in terms of the, whose financial balance has been upset. My question is uh, uh, for Mikhail Piotrowski, Director General of the State uh, Hermitage Museum, St. Petersburg. Uh, due to the pandemic, the museums uh, have, you know, faced many uncertainties, especially regarding their funding, especially when sometimes the public funding is not sufficient to, to remedy the uh, gaps, the losses, uh, uh, you know, museums. Uh, you've been accompanying the museum uh, for many decades uh, to always uh, uh, you know, keep up with its uh, reputation and its mission. What advice would you give when it comes to the diversification, the restructuring of the sources of financing to ensure the viability of our institutions today? Thank you. Well, I think the first thing is we need to remember that museums are reserves of memory, national memory, cultural memory, and so they must be kept. They must be financed by society. Museums can earn, can earn money, but you can't demand from them to earn money for living. There must be a state budget, there must be a big endowment, there must be activities of different companies. You know, during the COVID, a lot of people became much richer than they have been in companies, and we know them. So we have to orient on them. We have to uh, redivision the balance of different kinds of income for the museum. Uh, we definitely must not touch our collection, but we must learn better to sell our intellectual property, our intellectual production, monetizing our educational work for those who can pay. And for those who can't pay, they must be paid by those who can. This is the usual trick and this is how it must work. Uh, now we have to reorient the sense, not to well, make some beautiful exhibitions of Italian drawings or something, no, to have a to give money for social things, inclusion, 
inclusion mean everybody, uh, poor people, uh, people with special needs, uh, old people, students, that to make everybody, make for everybody, make art accessible for everybody. What we also learned now in pandemic and it will go on, art and culture is a luxury. It is a privilege which we are giving to people. That's because it is limited. It is limited, so it's a privilege to get it. Everybody must get this luxury. It's another thing. One is paying, one is not paying. So we have to work and balance so that everybody gets this luxury, but people must remember it is luxury. It is luxury. It is given from God. The culture comes from God to the to creator, and then creator gives it to other people. We must never forget about this. Uh, and we, sorry, and for instance, you mentioned the exhibition of the Iron Age. This exhibition of Iron Age in Hermitage was free, for free. A certain company paid for the tickets for all the period, and so they managed to make it free. So we are trying to do this different uh, ways. Uh, we have working now very hard to come back to the privileges which we had. We in Hermitage had a very big range of privileges. One third of people have been coming for free for Hermitage. Now it changed. So we're working every day to find ways, very concrete ways of how to finance this and that kind of social activities of the museum. And it's important for us, we're finding the way, important for society to understand where they're giving money and it's important for people to understand that really nothing comes free. Somebody has to work for making collections, everything accessible. This is a democracy of the museum. The museum is the most democratic institution in the world because it has something for everybody. But everybody must understand how this mechanism works. And we, and we have to change this mechanism. And it is mostly based on the changing the balances between monetizing your work, state, companies, and all together. It's an interesting journey. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed, it's important to find this um, balance for all every situation in the museum. Every situation must find its own logic. So thank you for emphasizing this aspect. And also the accessibility and the issue of accessibility and to open for uh, everyone. Now we'll ask a question to Ahmed Farouk Gornheim. Yes, can you repeat still the online? question? Yes, he is. I cannot hear. Uh, uh, earlier you said that the construction of the museum really was uh, well underway and the COVID did not really have any impact. Yes. But it has an impact on its opening. So how are you preparing to the opening of the museum? What are the expectations? What strategic plan do you have for this new national museum? Okay. For this opening. Okay. Um, uh, let me let me start by by identifying the the main uh, points of strength in in the in the National Museum of Egyptian Specialization uh, Civilization. Um, there are a number of points of strength, and I'll, I'll emphasize the three of them. Number one, we are distinguished from the different museums in Egypt because of how we handle the issue of civilization. Most of the museums would be focusing on one theme that is Pharaonic or Islamic or Coptic or what have you. The museum here is based on the concept of a cross cutting theme, taking all the civilizations in one tour. So that's one distinguishable issue that characterizes the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization compared to other museums in Egypt and makes it unique in that sense. The other uh, point of strength uh, that we have here are the mummies, the royal mummies. And it's not the matter of the mummies themselves, 
but it's how they are displayed. The, the mummy's hall that we have gives you the impression and the atmosphere of being in a grave where some of the coffins as well are there and some of the personal utensils that some of the kings and queens uh, were using are as well displayed beside the mummy and the coffin, as well as stories set behind it. So that again is another point of strength of the National Egypt Egyptian National Museum of uh, Civilization. The third point of strength, which is very unique, I believe so in all the museums around the world, is that we don't deal with the museum as a museum per se, but rather as a cultural hub. And in the, what do I mean by cultural hub? Having, as some of the museums might have, uh, very up-to-date labs, as well as uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, of different aspects related to museums, but we do as well have entertainment, uh, cultural entertainment activities whether this is uh, related to uh, theater or to cinema or to specific uh, 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 shops dealing or bazaars dealing with, with specific uh, Egyptian uh, products that deal with uh, ancient history or civilization from different parts of Egypt. And in that sense, uh, those are value added and those points of strength, we intend to use them um, in the coming period as a widening market. So if you, if you, if you want to market yourself as, as a museum only, people might be a little bit reluctant uh, to come. Okay, let's wait till COVID is over and so on and so forth. But uh, marketing and branding the place using the points of strength open uh, the venue for having different and more type of customers. Yet all the precautionary measures are taken. The more, and the final thing, we are making sure uh, it will be there, not only because COVID, but that's how we want to distinguish ourselves with our two issues. The first issue is the technological edge. So we're trying to have a special uh, uh, icon or uh, to and virtual tours using this icon to take the people different ages we're adding this technological edge in a lot of games and a lot of uh, presentations, uh, making it feasible to have uh, some kind of uh, interaction. Uh, uh, and that's, that's, that's another aspect that is already in the, in, the, in the mind setup of the people who designed this place, but we are leaning to depending on it more in the coming period because of COVID. And finally, taking extra care of uh, disability and disabled people by providing special and specific tours uh, uh, for them, making sure that the different types of rural language or, or different types of activities that they might be interested in is available in this place. Uh, so those are how the strategy is being built upon. The points of strength and making use of those, uh, I would say niches that distinguish this, the, the museum, not only in Egypt, but all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very exhaustive uh, answer. And to explain this very cultural uh, experience that you are building at the moment, which will be both, uh, that people will be experiencing physically and virtually. Then my penultimate question is for Antonio Sabaret of the, the director of the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico. So recently your museum started to work with UNESCO to improve risk management and also to improve uh, emergency preparedness in order to develop a comprehensive risk management plan, which will also be used as a module and as a basis for other cultural institutions in Mexico. So what are the main challenges and risks facing museums in the post-pandemic context? And also what priorities do you see for the future 
uh, to mitigate those risks or to prevent those risks? That's a tough one, uh, a tough question. Uh, uh, we have been working on the safety of our museum during the past, uh, the past few years. In fact, the lockdown helped us to, to install a new equipment uh, for detection of smoke and prevention of fire within the, the premises of the museum, all the premises. And uh, this, 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 what what you mentioned, Emmanuel, is part of this uh, our interest in the building of a safe, uh, a safe museum for the future. Uh, at the same time, where when, when you ask this, uh, I I always uh, go back to the the words of the people. Uh, that work on the construction of this museum. As Mikhail said, we are just keepers. We owe uh, a lot to our predecessors and to the people that are ahead of us. And one of those persons said about the museum that the museum is, we should have in mind that the museum is the more democratic institution that we have. It, it is much more democratic than the school because the museum don't ask for a degree for, to get in. And it is more, more democratic than libraries because neither your identity needs to be exposed. So we have to work with this in, in, this in mind. And at the same time, to, to build a, a, a safe space for all of for all of those visitors, which you can divide in two more uh, two groups, uh, uh, and this division goes also it, it it is linked with two 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 tasks uh, for the museum, education and research. So it it is very important. We. The, the museum is also an archive of material culture. So keeping this in mind, uh, give us a clear, clear, a clear idea of, of our responsibility in working in a museum. We've got to build a safe space inside for the collections and for the visitors. So the, nothing will be little. No, it, it is important to work each and every day on the construction of a, of a safe space for, for, all, for all these things. That, that's, that's what I think. And we have to try each and every day to improve uh, uh, our tools to maintain in a very good shape our collections and our visitors. Now, nowadays that we have opened the, the museum for the, for the visit, we, we work uh, hard in this in 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 this aspect too. They uh, the, it it is important for the visitor to know that it, that the museum is a safe space for their health also. You know, thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, time is going very fast, so I only have one question left, and hopefully we'll have uh, sometimes left also for a Q&A and to have final uh, remarks from our uh, speakers. So the last question is for Mr. Hamadi Bokum from... So the museums in Africa have become to establish broad models for being more inclusive with local communities which we actually spoke about earlier with the Smithsonian. And I think already you already have put up several projects uh, in close relationship with local communities, for example, to uh, organize or to design uh, exhibitions. Also, one of the particularities of or peculiarities of the African environment is 
how is the importance of uh, well how the the size of the youth population and one of the question we can ask is actually how you include uh, young people also how you engage and inspire young people to come to the museum because the, the youth actually are 65 percent of the african population and for young people uh, and also in the cultural dna uh well going to the museum is not always uh, obvious well thank you very much before answering to this uh, question I would like to speak about uh, how we lived, uh, how we experienced and managed COVID-19. Can you hear me? We didn't really hear the beginning. Or maybe I just lost part of it. So I'd like to say a few words on uh, the impact of COVID-19, because we had to close the museum. And it really caught us by surprise. We didn't know what to do. It was totally new for us. So we had to close, but to keep the whole of the staff. And the state really helped us for the whole staff uh, could still be paid during the COVID period. And now we have reopened and that's very important because museums are very safe space. And with all uh, measures, uh, hygiene measures that were uh, given by the uh, WHO, we actually managed to reopen. And so it was, the situation was complex when we were closed, but today it's also complex when actually we've opened. We had a section that uh, where we were exhibiting like lots of artifacts from the Quai Branly, from your museum, but we actually had, it, it was called the Masked Dialogue. It, and unfortunately, we've not been able to really have the same uh, exhibition today. And today it's very difficult and very complex for visitors and for us. And now, uh, how do we manage the relations between the publics, uh, the museums? And one of the essential questions which we have to answer is that of mediation. In all sectors, one finds mediators who organize visits, uh, we sometimes call them guides, and they would organize the visits. The mediator, the modern mediator, is someone who explains, but who also listens, learns, and teaches at the same time. And several times we had visitors who would give us information on some objects we had in our collections. Recently, I went to the Sangor Museum some people passed by saying this piece of fact uh, piece of furniture was made by my grandfather we knew that we had a, an old bed but we didn't know who had made the old bed so your uh, mediator should not be a mr know everything but should be somebody who teaches and learns at the same time and the young people you're right it's very important 65 percent of the african population is made up of young people today we have 43 percent of local visitors and amongst those 43 percent 75 percent are young people it's good, but it's not sufficient. There's still more work to be done in terms of communication and mediation. The young people whom we have today have no complex at all. They're easygoing, they discuss with anyone, they're borderless thanks to the internet and the digital. And they want to learn what is happening elsewhere. They want to see beyond uh, uh, the box they're put in. And they want to go out of the box, see the world and discover other cultures. 
We had an exhibition on Leonardo da Vinci, which just ended. It was followed by the young people, and the young people come with their parents over the weekend. And this exhibition had great success. We are working the Cape Henley Museum and the Picasso Museum today to prepare a Picasso exhibition in 2022 in Dakar. And the public uh, is yearning for even more. I think we have to stop considering the African public as people interested only by ethnology. They are very open. They want to discover the others. They want to see otherness. And it's important to make, uh, to bring the exhibitions to Africa and, uh, and exclusively Western Asian uh, exhibitions. We want to know you as much as you want to know us. And I'd like to stress on two major concepts with regards to this museum. We consider the Museum of Civilization, and I'm not just speaking uh, as myself, I'm expressing the opinion expressed by the whole museum when it was opened. We consider that this is a museum where you meet with the world. You meet with the world, you discuss with everyone. We're not exclusive, we're inclusive. And the other important element is related to COVID. COVID will not beat us because we are in the a continuous process of creation for humanity. So to summarize, I believe that the situation is difficult for all museums, but we are going to invent a new form of museums to master them better and to share cultures through those new museums. Uh, do you still hear me? I have finished. Does Emmanuel hear me? Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, Amadi. Thank you very much, uh, Hamadi. I was listening to you through English interpretation because I did not hear you properly uh, directly. I could hear the English better. So I'm now turning to the organizers because we are slightly late. Do we still have time to take questions from the public. I saw a question earlier on, Lazar. Do we have time for at least a question? Well, at least two questions, yes. And then we'll do a last tour with our panelists. There was a question that came from Martina from the Czech Republic. She put a question about the growing importance of the digital in museums and the way it could have an incidence on authenticity. Authenticity is a central uh, theme in the history of museums. So would any one of you like to answer this question reviewing the notion of authenticity because of the pressing development of digital avatars. If you'll allow, I'll react immediately. Hamadi. Authenticity means nothing to me. The masks, for instance, that the Dakar Djibouti collected between Dakar and Djibouti when monuments were desacralized, the population considered that the masks had no sacred value anymore. Uh, same goes for the road of kings in Cameroon. So we create authenticity all the time. We shouldn't just be frozen because of this question of authenticity. Secondly, the objects which we possess today are authentic, but at the beginning they were in, uh, they were produced for foreigners and tourists, for white men and tourists. Uh, they were produced to, to be sold to the tourists on the beaches. The authentic pieces were uh, hidden in houses and we had no access to them. African museums in the field of art or uh, handicraft use what exists 
if we don't do it today, if we don't gather this art and this handicraft today, in 100 years, the children will tell us, we, we, we were robbed. You should have kept this wealth of art which was created. So we have collections of old pieces and modern pieces because today's pieces will be the old pieces of tomorrow. Thank you, Hamadi. Uh, your comment on this notion of authenticity. Would any other panelists like to express a different comment, another vision, or the question of initial authenticity of the object and the relation between the physical object and the virtual object? No other comment amongst our panelists? No, in fact, I do have one. I'll raise my hand, if you allow me. Excuse me, I didn't see you. You have the floor, sir. Well, actually, authenticity is a very, very flexible term, but I would say that uh, what uh, distinguishes uh, uh, part of the museum that uh, I have the honor to be directing is the authenticity and authenticity in, in, in many ways. Authenticity uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, how things were evolved in terms of uh, non-tangible aspects of how life was, uh, was, was, was happening because the idea is telling a story. Authenticity, it doesn't mean necessarily being unique and old, but it can be a matter of a way of life. And, um, and definitely, that's what we are trying to show in the case of uh, the uh, National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. It's not a matter of having a piece, but what's the story behind this antiquity? What's the story behind this uh, monument? What's the story behind this piece of stone or piece of metal? This what means authenticity for me as a vision in this place. It's a way of life. It's, uh, it's, it's societies, how they were developed. It's, it's the way of thinking. And by this attitude, you can defy authentic authenticity based on the vision. Uh, and that's how we see it in the case of the museum that I am directing. Thank you. Emmanuel? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. May I say Antonio, something? Antonio, I give you the floor. Antonio. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. Maybe uh, another side of it is the the issue of authenticity uh, is related with the, how did the process of the digitizing collection, digitized collections, uh, endangers the authenticity of, of a piece how it uh, multiplies the possibility of a replica or 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 or, um, or a sham or something like that as i said the digitizing process help the museum to open their doors and to break uh, an inertia i think and it, it it is important to share what we have online I think it's one of the most important important process processes in the in the history in the recent history of of our museums, and this will help will help them to fulfill their their mission, and and I and I think will never put in danger their collections. I, I, I I'm optimistic about the about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for this optimistic vision, which encourages us to continue. And before concluding the panel, I'm turning to Lazar to see whether we have a few more minutes. Can we ask our panelists to conclude on the conclusions? Any final comment? 
Dear panelists, I would like to thank you for your participation. But if you do have a last word of wisdom to share with us, please do so. Even all the questions we have mentioned are very wide questions, but can you give us uh, reason for hope in this difficult period of uh, those uh, museums that are closed as ours and uh, whom the public is yearning to see again. I'll give the floor to Mrs. Mack. Any final comment to share with us, madam? I think that one uh, concern that we have all expressed has also become this concern about the, the difficulties associated with the pandemic have also in a sense presented an opportunity. All of our institutions have been required to really pause and to review our internal practices. It, it has pushed our, us against the wall in many respects. And you really begin to take the long view. You begin to truly prioritize, not only internally, but it makes you look at your outward facing practice as well and your future in terms of really redefining your public value. Um, if, if there is, it's been great difficulty and it still is, um, but I think that there have been really advantageous insights and new practices and new opportunities that have emerged. In many ways, again, it has leveled the playing field in terms of just basic communication and provided us with opportunities to communicate with each other and with our publics in ways that often did not happen before. Thank you for this opportunity. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you very much, madam. I now turn to Antonio Saborit. Any last comment to make? Well, the, as you as you as you mentioned before, I am a historian, and I. I wouldn't change my humble craft for that of a prophet, uh, but uh, notwithstanding that, that uh, I I think that uh, the this slowing down process that we were, we have been through living through uh, can could can teach us a lot of 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 lessons, and it's important to to keep in mind what we have thought during this, these past months, because sooner or later, we're going to be uh, dragged for the new nor by the new normality. And it will be very easy to forget the those fantastic, fantastic ideas that we had during the lockdown. So uh, uh, let, let Let's yes. make the most of this, of this uh, co considerations, reflections, ideas, and let's work together to put them at work in the near future. Hopefully, you no. Know? Uh, as someone said uh, in the panel, we are stronger working together. So let's let's do it and never forget, as Michael mentioned, that it it involves the human beings this this process and that we are we are we are about to build bridges that's that's uh, that is, that is a fantastic idea it's our responsibility to build a good bridge to dakar to saint petersburg to washington dc to paris everywhere and to connect among us our collections and and our ideas of the, of the world it is it, it is important not to forget this to keep this in mind in, in during better times that will come i'm sure thank you merci beaucoup pour cet appel à, à... thank you very much for this call for unity and sharing uh, michael petrovsky what are your final comments? Your microphone is not on, uh, Mikhail. Could you please turn on your microphone, Mr. Petrovsky? Okay. Well, we have seen the pandemic, we are not out of 
out of it. So we have to have in mind, we don't need now to reinvent the museums. Museum has been invented. We have to see that, understand that now, museum is one of the best medicines for the situation in which the humanity is. It's medicine with memory, because it keeps the memory which makes us more comfortable that we have memory. And it also gives medicine in education. Education is a good medicine, but we have to be very aware not to change this medicine into poison. Memory and education can be medicine and could be poison, and it's all in our hands, and museums play in this a very important role. Walls or dialogues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ahmed Farouk from Cairo. Do you have a last comment? Yes, I would just like to thank you for this opportunity. And I would consider it as a great brainstorming session among colleagues and friends in the field. Um, I do see always an opportunity in such a challenge we're living in. It gave us time to rethink how to adapt. I'm sure all of the friends here had things to do that have been postponed and the lockdown helped us to look differently uh, at things, to look deeply in things, to, to, to revise our strategy. Uh, definitely, since if life is going on as normal, uh, then there would have been no time and uh, it has been uh, a, a life where uh, uh, everything goes as 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 we we're moving by the by the acceleration of the forces uh, of every day. But this lockdown allowed us to rethink our future and uh, revise our strategy. And again, I just have one thing that I would ask is that the main ideas that came out of this uh, brilliant uh, panel and as well the one before if it can be wrote down in, in, in a, some kind of a guidelines or, or, or summary or abstract of, uh, of this uh, meeting, it would be great and it would help us to, to revive what we agreed upon or what we shared among ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe that your suggestion was duly noted by the organizers. And I believe that it was their intent. The last speaker this afternoon will be you, Hamadi Bokum. What are your final comments? And I will then give the floor back to the organizers. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I totally share what the conclusions of Antonio in the digital field, it's very useful, it can serve us. I spoke about Leonardo da Vinci, it's a digital exhibition, but a digital, to the nanometer that the public have really appreciated. Let's avoid going from the digital to the virtual. COVID has something incredible is to creating that social distancing notion. It fragmented the society. In the in the curing process, we have to bring it back together to create a new humanity. That is very important. My big dream is that very quickly we all be able to get together, not only virtually, but uh, in the in presence and to look at each other straight in the eyes, to have emotions, to uh, laugh, eat, drink together. That's my message. Merci, merci, thank you, thank you notre, uh, very much. That is a uh, 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 wish for all of us. Uh, I wanted to thank you, dear panelists, uh, for having participated in the panel and also thank our uh, listeners. Uh, your ideas are so inspiring and it's really heartwarming to be in the midst of the this community because you have said that museums are communities, the museums amongst each other are an extended community. And this notion 
this perception also allows us, and that's what we tried to do today, thanks to UNESCO, to develop a form of collective intelligence uh, because we all exercise in specificities, uh, but in this sharing, we have an inspiring means of developing our museums where they are and to develop uh, in a way, as you've mentioned, is uh, why, you know, uh, the, the, the museums and their inspire, make understand, bring the cultures together. Director de, uh, Lazar, we have uh, completed uh, our panel session. Thank you very much indeed for having allowed this uh, these two panels to meet. Thank you very much, uh, dear Emmanuel, for this uh, very efficient moderation of the debate and uh, what has uh, come out of it. And I think all these very interesting and relevant uh, avenues for the future of uh, the post-COVID museums uh, uh, will continue and we'll all remain together. A big thank you to all the panelists, uh, directors of museums, uh, our immense gratitude uh, to you all. And thank you for having uh, shared with us your ideas uh, that will allow us uh, to plan for cooperation projects, uh, which will allow us to talk about them at the next museum forum that we will be holding in September. And we'll, of course, give you all the information on it. I now have the pleasure to invite uh, the Assistant Director General for Culture, uh, Mr. Ernesto Ottone, for him to give us his uh, impressions uh, as a conclusion of this very rich debate. Ernesto, you have the floor. Thank you, Lazar. Uh, dear friends, I'll start with that. Uh, as you uh, mentioned uh, for us uh, as UNESCO, this debate uh, was uh, very enlightening uh, for us. Of course, we're not out of the pandemic, and that uh, is something that needs to be uh, pointed out. Uh, so these debates, uh, discussions are important. And I'm talking as a former director of museum. I'm also by your side with the suffering that this year represented, because even if one tries to find the positive side, there was a real interruption vis-a-vis -vis the work that is done in Museum Forever, but also in the last years to build a relationship that is even deeper between the communities and the um, the communities really, and the, uh, the, the power and the necessity of these structures. I would also like to thank you all and uh, welcome the participation of Alberto Gallandini and really thank him for his introductory words. ICOM, as you know, is a key partner for UNESCO and uh, we welcome our close and fruitful cooperation that is built every day. The debate today, which brought together 12 directors uh, of museums from the whole world, world over, has allowed us to have a very rich panorama overview of the state of things in um, the uh, museum sector and respond concretely to some of the uh, concrete challenges and prepare the future. The pandemic has touched all museums, be they private or public, be they small or big, uh, recent young institutions, but also very, very uh, old ones. The observation is without appeal. After having heard your interventions, I would like to emphasize several salient points by way of conclusion and by putting into perspective these exchanges. And of course, we are taking good note that there will be a recompiling of your interventions that we would like to share with this community and beyond. Now, the museums we know are not 
uh, you know, fixed institutions frozen. They are living organisms, uh, deeply anchored in our societies and very closely linked to the events of the world. To this effect, debate, debates have demonstrated the certain fragility of museums, even before the uh, hand, because they're the first victims of natural disasters, but they're also disasters caused by man. The COVID-19 crisis has affected museums and be over and beyond that, the, you know, I, beyond the isolated museums, the whole ecosystem that depends on them. Mr. Garantini uh, has reminded us that 30% of the museums uh, fear a reduction in their uh, staff and 6% talk about closures. The debate has uh, given us an overview of the concrete consequences of the crisis on the museums. Uh, the Beijing Museum talked about uh, 19 million visitors uh, less. Uh, to, from 19, some to three point uh, some million in a year. The re big reduction uh, in, you know, putting off inaugurations of big museums, cancelling of exhibitions, uh, putting online of uh, the exhibitions, etc. Despite uh, all of these big closures, uh, had a big, big uh, financial impact on these institutions. Uh, we spoke about, uh, I think it was uh, just Hunt spoke about uh, a big, uh, the, 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 the huge sort of losses uh, as a result of the closures. Uh, public museums got um, aid from the state, uh, but the debate reminded us that, of course, the museums have their strength in the face of the pandemic. The debates demonstrated that the museums had to adapt and develop strategies that were sometimes original, innovative. For some, the pandemics allowed the museum to come closer to the communities, to listen to them, to strengthen the link. Uh, the effort of solidarity between uh, museums uh, is uh, what Antonio Savaric spoke about. Um, Mr. Wong and uh, Mr. Hunt spoke about the fundamental link between culture and education, about the uh, you know, people to keep the link between parents, teachers, sharing of pedagogical material and other media. Uh, some uh, museums, such as the Palace in Beijing, uh, and, you know, strengthen their uh, digital strategy. The Palace put uh, in place uh, exhibitions for its 600th anniversary in 2020. Juliana Estropo uh, from Colombia emphasize the fact that as a result of a lack of digital knowledge of the staff, the digital adaptation was an enormous challenge. Uh, and the pandemic also represented an opportunity to adapt the museum to a new environment. Thanks to new technologies, uh, there was cultural content uh, that was uh, put online, uh, be in touch with the public uh, and connect with new public, and especially the youth uh, through internet, the museums were able to work with schools in order to assist the parents and teachers to create uh, innovative and pedagogical uh, projects. But the digital is, uh, the divide is bigger than ever. In 2020, only 5% of the museums in Africa and in small uh, developing island nations were able to propose online content, as was demonstrated by the World Report of the UNESCO on museums in the face of the COVID. Uh, over and beyond the digitization of the collections, uh, the crisis forced us all to open to change and be creative. The use, for example, of augmented reality, uh, uh, as uh, Antonio Sabarit uh, told us, uh, you know, important strategy, incredible potential in the design of the exhibitions and conceding uh, the, you know, intellectual property rights of museums. So exploring basically new forms of didactic space, uh, allowing us to vehiculate ideas and uh, concepts. The pandemic has also allowed the museum to do the necessary refurbishment work, which cannot be done when it's fully open and to update their documentation, for example. 
Mrs. Barbeyata and Mr. Wong both spoke about the measures put in place by the museum to open this year, namely the putting in place of uh, digital cameras in the entrance and online ticketing. So what is the future for museums? That is the big question that we are asking ourselves. We've often said that museums will need to reinvent themselves. These are the words of Hamadi Bakum. Indeed, uh, there is certain uh, processes that have been accelerated, uh, made certain more urgent, but these reflections to the future of the museums are important for young museums, those are being created, or age-old museums, 100-year-old museums. In UNESCO's study, the new figure that uh, we presented more than 94,000 museums in the world. That's enormous when you think uh, of uh, the strength as an institutional discourse, it's enormous. So whatever be their size or their localization, the museums question the role that they play in society or the, whether it, it, it inequalities increase and the environment is a, a reality. Each museum has to be able to respond to these fundamental questions, such as how do you, you know, remain essential, essential in the eyes of the community. Mrs. Deborah Mark had said this thing, which I it was which struck me with the increase of racism in America, in the world, we are facing a dual pandemic. In the face of the pandemic, the museums have shown their capacity to resist and to be resilient where UNESCO defends the right to culture. One would one should think about guaranteeing a right to digitalization of museums. That is to say, repositioning the museums with the digital global strategy to allow online access and training, education, all those examples which you have given. The right to digitize collections, inventories, and Barbara spoke about the difficulty between digital and in presence. Nothing replaces presence. And the digital can help to bring back people in the uh, museums. And Antonio said the digital has opened up the museums to the world to research and to keep the link with the public. Mr. Guarneri said the museums should be more inclusive. Culture is the symbol and the speaker of openness, respecting diversity and difference. We must part, make the public participate to this diversity. And we are thrilled of, of this debate, your debate of directors, uh, curators or followers. Dear friends, listening you on the questions, we understand that economic recovery following the crisis due to the pandemic will not be possible without the cultural sector, which contributes both economically and socially to development. Museums are the glue of social cohesion, and that is why they must be protected and supported. And even one single, and I say one single, of the 95,000 museums mentioned in UNESCO's last report of museum was not able to open in the future. That would mean that we are losing diversity, memory, identities, that we are losing decades of progress and struggle because there were struggles to build museums in some countries where there wasn't a single museum. The debate shows that the recommendation of 2015 of UNESCO on uh, the promotion, protection and promotion of museums and their collections and their, its role in the society. So this recommendation is as relevant today as uh, any time in the past to help museums to find their true role. This important tool should be shared more and used more. But what's even more important than that is the following. Behind the museum institutions, and I heard that several times today, 
behind every piece of art we can present in museums, there is first and foremost women and men that have created and will and who will continue to create and research and look there are women and men that keep those cultural assets and allow us to see them there are women and men in the world that visit museums and who have the right to contemplate those pieces of art and they demand this right. And I'm thinking about those women and those men, and this is to whom we are speaking today. A museum lives thanks to and because of the community it is in. And this was stressed several times. Mr. Mikhail Petrovsky, a big friend of UNESCO, said that museums must create bridges. This is the reason why UNESCO as international organization and agency of the UN for the specific mandate in the cultural sector would like to intensify cooperation with all cultural uh, players, including museums, local, regional institutions in relation to museums. This debate follows the line of the activity set up by UNESCO to support museums to uh, face the challenges such as the regional series we are developing. The second report on the impact of COVID on museums, almost nine months after the first report, or the second major high level forum on museums that will be held in September. And to conclude, I would like to say three small things. First of all, I'd like to tell you that nothing replaces the visits in presence in museums. And what you have said about that is fundamental, but we must find a means to allow, encourage people to come back in masses to our museums, whilst re respecting all the health measures. But I am convinced today that most museums are ready to reopen their doors, and welcome a public while respecting absolutely all the recommendations done by the World Health Organization. Secondly, and this I've heard in a forum recently about uh, Iber Museos of uh, Latin America and Spain. Someone said, we are not going to reinvent the wheel today. The museums have been reinventing them, themselves since the first opening of the first museum. We were told museums will have crisis. We had crisis. We were told museums will be replaced. They were reinforced. And it is time now to work all together to reassure everyone to make sure that the solidarity which was expressed today, this communion, I've heard the messages of today will allow us to ensure that our museums will be safe, protective, open to discussion and debate, and ready to prove that they represent a meeting point for different communities to guarantee the resilience the sustainability and the agenda 2030 for all our societies. Thank you to all. Uh, I, uh, we are more than thrilled uh, to have listened to you. We are proud to have welcomed you. Thank you for sharing with us all your comics. Once again, thank you in the name of the whole team, Lazar uh, and all the members of UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. The enthusiasm we can see on the screen shows that you've summarized everything and nothing more to add. We now have a new way to move forward together. We will continue on this new path. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to those that have facilitated the discussion, dear Lorella, dear Emmanuel. Thank you to you all. Thank you to our public 
who is always uh, present, follows our discussions. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you to the technical team behind this event. Thank you and see you soon. Bye.